<clears throat> there we go. All right, good afternoon. We'll go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order for the September 8th Water Task Force. Um, as a reminder, I know I've forgotten the last couple of meetings, but we do have a sign-in sheet at the back of the room. If you could please sign in, um, because we will be giving out a perfect attendance award. Um, <laughs> public comment. We'll open perfect to public attendance. comment if anybody has anything to say about water strategy task force related stuff please come forward good afternoon and excuse my voice I'll try the best I just want to give you all a heads up in case you're not already aware um, shy wolf sanctuary is proposing to purchase 10 acres on Benita Grand Road in the DRGR and uh, the article in the paper said that um, it had reached zoning process and I, I don't believe that's exactly true they have put in for a special exemption and then it goes to zoning and then in front of council now you might all remember a while back they wanted to move to the Bonita nature place and those of us that, who have been involved with it went to their sanctuary and I have to admit they do an awesome job of taking care of these animals but it was not appropriate at the nature place and it's not appropriate where they're proposing to put the 10 acres um, they have to scoop up the excrement, that's true, but what do you do with the urine? And also, um, I remember I heard comments saying, oh, the sound of the wolves howling, what a beautiful sound. Well, I'll tell you, we heard them howl, and when they get howling, yes, it's beautiful somewhere out in the boondocks, but not near a residential area. I don't think anybody would like to hear that on a regular basis. So I just want to give you a heads up and I'm asking you all to keep up with this when it goes in front of the zoning board and when it goes in front of council and just keep alert on it because my personal feeling, I love animals. I think those people are doing a wonderful job, but I do not think this is the proper place to put it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Anyone else for public comment? All right, seeing none, we're gonna move on to approval of minutes. Anybody have any, please? Yeah, I have one comment, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on page eight of 16, paragraph four, delete the words something dated 2003 and replace it with a 27 June 2013 map of the Bonita Springs Utility Wellfield Protection Zones showing one year, five year, and 10 year travel times. Did I go too fast? So it's 27 June 2013, map of the Bonita Springs Utilities Wellfield Protection Zones showing one, five, and 10 year travel times. All right. More than just something. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else with changes to the minutes? Uh, just cool. one clarification on the first page under the public that attended. Instead of Jeremy France, it's F-R-A-N-T-Z. All right. Anything else? Need a motion to approve them as? I'll make a motion. Fred? Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Moving on. Did we determine who's going first of our public uh, they all, or of they our uh, here, presentations? So <laughs> Did we flip a three sided coin? We had originally uh, indicated that it would be Serge, then Wynn, then Jim, because Jim is going to be running a little late, but we can do it in any order. And Jim, if you need to be somewhere else. No, I'm, I'm going to stay for the whole meeting. I'm sorry for you, but <laughs> <laughs> we may put, may put you to sleep. I'll give you a chance to get my shirt dry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll Serge? All right, so I guess I'll stop. <laughs> um, so that'll be the. Hold on, this is my. And Scott, okay. While well, just I'm just gonna present myself then. Oh, hang on. I was gonna say while they're setting that up, 
I don't know if you wanted to take questions and answers after each presentation or do them all at the end, whatever you guys are comfortable with, but, uh, you know. Yeah, and I'm guessing there's going to be a little overlap <laughs> with information, so right. maybe we want to wait until all three presentations are done, and then we can ask the, the kind of what I was thinking. Right. That's all right. I think that would uh, that would probably be best. So, okay, Serge, sorry, go ahead. So, um, I'm an assistant professor at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University. I uh, hold a PhD in oceanography and limnology from University of Paris, France, uh, 2001. So, uh, came here in 2000. Uh, one, actually to study the Everglades, especially the algae in the Everglades, and uh, came to FGCU in 2008 to study, uh, well, everything that has water, uh, including uh, retention detention ponds. That's why I'm here today. So I started actually to work on retention detention pond uh, back in 2005 when I was still working at FG FIU uh, with the uh, city of Miami, uh, Lake, Lake Miami, uh, Miami Lakes, actually. So um, how do I change slide that I have full control or let me see, I do, no, wrong. <laughs> Here it goes, okay, I got yeah. it, perfect. Um, so basically um, this is actually a presentation I put together for the Florida Lake Management Society that was held uh, last summer. Uh, and um, you know, I have a, a lot of student work was me, so this is just a, an idea of what they've been doing. So we've been looking at, especially at, you know, how many ponds are out there, you know, what's the volume of pond all combined. Uh, we're also looking at nutrient <coughs> concentration in these ponds, how much phosphorus you have in the water, nutri uh, you know, nutrient in the water. We're also looking at copper as well, you know, because copper has been used to kill the algae. And um, we also uh, look at, um, the so sediment especially, you know, people have a lot of concern about uh, how fast they're feeling and uh, if the sediment is actually safe to be removed or handled uh, outside the pond. So I'm gonna show you just a few examples of, of some of my research, not everything, of course. Uh, also work on natural lake, Lake Trafford, for example, with, with Rene Abraham and, and David Seeley. So this was just was a name, uh, the title, so Stormwater Pond, you know, thousands of ticking time bomb, and I really think that, you know, uh, a lot of them are ca actually got old or actually got receive a lot of nutrients, and they behave no longer as a a, a cure to prevent pollution to the, to the downstream ecosystem, but actually they start to be a pollution themselves. So that's what I'm going to try to demonstrate to you guys today. So I suppose everybody knows what a, what is a wet versus a dry pond. You know that was supposed to be for a general audience, so I guess we'll we'll keep it the same. Uh, so, you know, you have two different types of ponds here. The one actually are above uh, higher elevation than the groundwater table. So these are dry ponds, and I don't really study those. And we also have the wet pond, which basically have water all year round, and they're actually are, um, they're the bottom of the pond is sitting lower than uh, the uh, um, groundwater table. And uh, generally, they're, they're built uh, this way, so you can have actually a, 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 a shallow water where you actually grow plants. And the plants are supposed to be part of the system, meaning they're supposed to actually inter uh, intercept the nutrient before they enter the system, also uh, slow down the pace of the water if there is any, and also uh, filter the water like a mechanical filter in your aquarium pump. Uh, so generally what's recommended is about 35% cover of these plants, and very often they're absent because uh, the homeowner don't like them because they like to have that glacial lake appearance that they have up north, especially for, for the people who migrate from, you know, from uh, North America down to here in the, in the, in the winter. Um, and then you have a, a deeper portion of the pond which is actually used as a, I call a decantation pit. So basically everything settles down. Everything that's heavy could be heavy metal, could be silt, could be mud, could be uh, you know sand, etc. And then eventually you have uh, here a, a um, a little uh, overflow box that you have on the, on the up uh, right corner that if that's a detention pond, it will just detain the water during the dry season and release the water during the rainy season. You know, everybody who's been to detention knows that. You're not there forever. Uh, but you also have the retention pond where basically they actually collect the water and the water stays there. And the only uh, connection with the outside world would be evaporation, concentration, and eventually also um, infiltration through the the bottom of the pond through, through the groundwater. So here especially I'm going to talk about detention ponds. So uh, normally um, the, the residence time of the water in average during the full year is 
technically supposed to be a little bit higher than two weeks. So with two weeks, especially during the rainy season, you know, you have the water that can turn over completely. So uh, meaning that if you have very polluted water, that water can eventually be flushed out very quickly out of the system. Uh, and there's supposed to be, again, a system to clean the water. So the removal rate is about 80% for a pollutant load for class three and 95% for class two. That's from Livingston, 1993. Uh, also slow down the water, the pace of the water, meaning that during the dry season, keep the water inland the way we used to be, and then during the rainy season, deliver it to, to, the, to the system, uh, to the downstream ecosystem. So the efficiencies here are just numbers, but uh, TSS tends to, for total suspended solids, that's basically everything that's suspended in the water column that can, you know, make the water turbid. So that's 75 to 85% TN, nitrogen from 37 to 60%, TP 59 to 85%, and metal 40 to 80%. Uh, so these are the targets, um, knowing that, you know, uh, the best system actually, uh, maybe we'll have that for discussion, to really clean the water will be wetland, because wetland would probably not leave anything out. Everything will be sequestered into the wetland, but people don't like wetland, it attracts snakes and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, since those are the comments I have, but uh, I'll talk to you about a system which mixes uh, wetlands floating onto a lake. We'll talk about that. Um, so. When I arrived here, I said, do you have an idea of how many ponds we have? And nobody knew really how many we had. And actually now they start to build a, a GIS a database to realize, to realize that actually we have a ton and ton and ton of ponds here. Uh, my student and I, uh, starting in 2011, started to count how many ponds we have. And we counted 7,632 wet ponds, not including the, uh, you know, the DOT ponds. So there really are a lot of ponds out there. Some of them are not permitted. Um, you know, some of them actually are called wells, turn out into to be ponds, because we looked at the permit to be able to find out. Uh, we're also working on getting their age as well. And then for Clear County, we found 3,837. So as you can see, roughly about 10,000 ponds. Now, what's the footprint of that for the, um, you know, for, for us? The footprint is about 22.1 uh, uh, square miles for Lee County, for the entire Lee County, so about 1.8% uh, footprint. So that's probably be a surface area. And 0.8% uh, footprint for Collier County, but keep in mind that Collier County has you know, a lot of uh, places where there's you know, pretty wild, wild uh, uh, land there, right? But 17.6 square miles, so about roughly the same as Lee and Collier, about the same. Most of them are kind of small, as you can see on that, on that uh, diagram. And average size is roughly about between two and three acres, so small ponds, most of them. So do they work? What do you all think? Well, I think that if we're here today, if I'm here today, it's because they, they seem to not work fully. Uh, and uh, normally, you know, when we look at that graph, we see that the, that's a showing the phosphorus level in water uh, increasing until 1982, where they were implemented to actually remove the, the phosphorus, especially because phosphorus is a big problem in Florida. It looks like we have a decrease of the phosphorus level until in 2005. I don't have the rest of the data. Unfortunately, that's somebody who shared that slide with me started to increase again. So there is either uh, more ponds that get more polluted or actually these ponds are older. That's what I'm trying to find out. They're releasing more phosphorus. So here is actually, a, a, not from my research, but from uh, City of Naples, which I worked very closely. And they looked at their uh, removal efficiency. So basically the, the retention rate. So if you have a positive retention rate, you're retaining nutrient. If you have a negative retention rate, you actually are producing nutrient from the pond. And you can see that some of them has minus 123 for TN, minus 192, meaning they actually are the source of pollution and not really a detention, retention pond as a water cleaning efficiency. As you can see, up to 363% uh, for, for TP for, for one of the lake. You also have a lot of fecal coliform. You know, you had the lady talking about uh, uh, fecal matters and also that end up into the pond. So that could be a problem as well. They're nutrient, but also they carry you know, diseases. We also have a lot of problem with you know, fish kill because uh, when you have high organic and high nutrient level, you know, uh, the bacteria will suck up all the oxygen from the water, especially when it's hot. The, the water will become anoxic and you have a lot of fish kill. Um, the other thing is that one of the reasons is that it turned bad is because people have a, a um, and put a value on this pond that didn't exist at the time they were built. So actually I had some student trained to compare houses actually are facing a pond and housings that are not facing a pond, you know, looking at 
comparable, of course, in those three, there's a three-bedroom, we try to compare. And they found about 9% added value for, for the real estate market when you actually have a front view property. Um, so real estate really understood that very well uh, because what they did is that instead of having a very uh, geometric pond, meaning square or round pond, they actually make it highly convoluted. This is Longshore Lake. You know, I call it the Lasso Lake. So as you can see, it's like a canal all around, but you can put a lot of houses around. And a lot of houses mean also a lot of lawns, and a lot of lawns mean also eventually a lot of fertilizer that drain into the pond. So that's another thing here. I'm just trying to play here, but basically you have all the different shapes imag imaginable uh, just to put as many houses as possible. Now, I know that uh, right now we're kind of moving away from that design, but it was in the 90s especially, in 2000, I saw a lot of these design island walk, village walk, you know, all of these are have problems and they contacted me because they have problems because too many houses around. All right, so, um, you know, the main problem is, that was for a meeting. <laughs> so, you know, uh, most of them have sod, you know, around. And, uh, you know, sod is the number one, actually, crop being grown in Florida. It's not citrus. It's actually crop. And people want to have their uh, lawn surrounding it, you know, completely devoid of natural vegetation, just sods. And, you know, flora time, which is not necessarily the best, needs a lot of watering, a lot, a lot of fertilizer. Now it's victim, uh, victim of chinch bugs as well that, you know, eat it. So you have to use a lot, use a lot of pesticide. Uh, so it's monoculture, basically. And when you plant monoculture, you have all the problems that are linked to monoculture. When there is a pest actually kill that monoculture, everything crashes, and then you got, you're up for a, a replacement, right? Um, so um, there's a lot of money around. Uh, actually, some students actually are working on the economics around this pond, and it's kind of, you know, uh, employs a lot of people. Uh, you also have some old design, like the, the photo, photograph uh, on the top right, where you see just a culvert draining actually a parking lot, just, you know, bringing everything. There is no filtration, no nothing, because I, I perceive as the lawns or the vegetation surrounding the pond as part of the system to filter the water. But right now we have lawns that actually pollute the system. But it could be better. We could improve it uh, if we actually have natural grasses that will filter the water before we enter the pond and the pond that would polish the water before actually the water get exported. I think there are ways to make them very, very efficient if we want to. Um, so there's also the, uh, the appearance, you know, people want to have that glacial lake appearance. Remember that most of the people here are snowbirds coming from the north. They are accustomed to these glacial lakes which are low in nutrients, devoid of vegetation most of the time, or with vegetation but no algae at least. And um, they, they want their lake to look like that. Uh, problem is that in Florida, you basically are, are fighting the system because the system wants to be naturally like the Everglade-like system, and they don't want the Everglade-like system. They want the glacial lake system. So they use all chemicals and all means possible to prevent this uh, to happen. All right, so they want to have clear water, most of the time devoid of shoreline and literal vegetation, even though they're supposed to have 20% at least of vegetation planted. And they like, you know, lush, non-native, monospecific, ruderal grasses, a.k.a. turf, around it. Um, this is an example of uh, Bayside Bay Creek that I work on uh, for a year, and I'm going to continue that for another year. Uh, you know, most of the lake actually are eutrophic, hypertrophic, um, with a few exceptions. The only exception is uh, oligotrophic, so I use a lot of words here. Oligotrophic, mesotrophic, and eutrophic mean the amount of nutrients you have in there. So when it's eutrophic, it means you have a lot of nutrients, eutru. Uh, hyper, you know, lots of nutrients. Oligo, very few nutrients. Um, and you can see that only a few lakes have very, very few nutrients. And actually, these are wetland lakes, kind of. So they're actually a control. These are the lakes that could be if we actually maintain them the way uh, without putting nutrients into these ponds. So um, just to show you, uh, I also used, uh, not mentioned here, but, you know, EPA as a new uh, criteria for uh, nutrients. So that's, and actually all these lakes actually were impaired beside two for uh, the EPA nutrient uh, criteria. So not, not so good here. Um, this is Village Walk here. Uh, again, uh, very uh, dendritic lake, convoluted, a lot of houses around. Um, this lake is actually only eutrophic, and I say only eutrophic because they actually have a permit that allows them to pump groundwater into the lake. So the lake has been reflushed, reflushed all the time by groundwater, which actually helps it to maintain its uh, relatively good 
uh, water quality, but if they stop pumping, it probably would turn into an island walk problem when you have a lot of algae growing. Island walk looks very like uh, village walks. They're very close to each other, but island walk has a lot of problems, village walks less. Um, and then you have, you know, a bunch of different algae. When you do this, you know, you're basically a preventing, I mean, you have nutrient sources getting into the lakes. You also are using uh, nutrient to make the, the grass grow very well. This flush into the lake. The, the grass is not really doing its role in preventing, you know, um, nutrient from getting into the lake. So you're having uh, lakes are growing algae. And some of these algae are benthic algae, meaning they grow on the bottom. And they create these mats. So, so here, that's a uh, horse hair, pit pitophora, uh, and cladophora to the right. So uh, they can completely choke your system very, very quickly. And you can have also some very, very bad one here, some cyanobacteria, so blue-green algae. Some of them can be very toxic. Uh, we never had a case of people getting you know, intoxicated. But when you have a fontaine, especially where you could create a mist of that toxin in the air, that would not be good. Um, it could happen. Um, some of these lakes can be very, very, very highly hypertrophic, and you have all the ingredients to have these algae to proliferate. Um, and then you have some things that's unique to here, and I really like to spend a little bit of time here for you guys to understand is that you have some actual lakes that are very healthy. And the problem is that lake in Florida, especially when you have uh, a lake that's dug into calcium carbonate, so limestone uh, based lake, uh, the water is very hard water. And uh, when you have low nutrient, you actually turn into a system which looks like exactly like the Everglades, where you grow these algae, which people call scum, but actually they're good algae. Uh, they actually are bioindicator of very, very good healthy water. And the problem is that people, people spray copper sulfate on them to kill those algae. <laughs> and when they decay on the bottom, they start releasing nutrient. And eventually, even though the lake has low nutrient loading outside, by killing these algae recurrently, you actually are ending into the same state as a lake loaded with nutrients. So that's, that's a big problem that I have. And I know they're not very nice looking, but actually, uh, if people just spend the time to go in the Everglades, that's what they see everywhere. These are naturally occurring in Florida. There are ways to prevent those from growing, and I'll talk about it. It's mostly being plant, planting and met, making the water a bit darker with, for example, using blue dyes to prevent them from growing on the bottom. So the copper sulfate, you probably heard about it. It's cheap. I call it a uh, crack addict. Basically, it's cheap. You, it's efficient. You kill the algae very quickly. Uh, problem is, uh, because it's so efficient and cheap, you, know, you tend to use more and more and more until the system do not respond anymore. Actually, some cyanobacteria can become uh, resistant to that copper sulfate. And then you, you're left with no options, really, rather than dredging. Um, this is just to show you some uh, copper uh, sulfate. This is actually Pelican Bay, who actually is under investigation right now. They're releasing too much copper into the, the, the Gulf of Mexico. So they have three or four years to fix a problem before they get fined or they have to do something. But you can see the copper concentration is very high, up to 800 micro, micro uh, gram per liter. So that's parts per billion. It looks very, very small, but actually it's very, very high. It will kill especially the, the uh, organism that actually fight algae. So you will kill, for example, mollusks that will graze on algae and plants uh, because they're highly sensitive to this. You will also kill zooplankton, so you know the little micro crustaceans that live in the water that actually graze on the phytoplankton because that kills them directly. So you're defenseless against uh, algae bloom, and that's what I meant. It's like, a, it's like a crack addict. You get into it and you can't get out because it's, uh, you're killing pretty much the system by doing this. So it's totally maintained artificially. Uh, I'll pass this, but these are just to, uh, one of my students try to look at, you know, the threshold level of uh, copper sulfate, and it looks like all the mollusks basically with uh, the water that we have in Pelican Landing will die. That's what it shows. I don't have time to really show you how it works. And eventually, this is Naples Bay here, you know, it gets into Naples Bay, and uh, um, so this culvert and uh, pumping station, and then, you know, poison the, the bay in the end. So in the end, everybody loses because, you know, you can pollute the bay. The oyster might be also poisoned because they're also invertebrates. And, you know, uh, you can have a lot of nutrients which will grow, you know, seaweeds in the bay or eventually red tides. Uh, now, the sediment is another problem. You know, some people want to dredge. And some people want to dredge because there's a lot of, you know, muck accumulation. But before you dredge, you're supposed to do an assessment of how much you have there 
to estimate, estimate the cost, but also how much uh, copper and heavy metal you have there, because if it's high in heavy metal, then you have to uh, treat it as, you know, other just waste. You know, it's toxic waste. You can't really dump it into a, a, land, uh, a landfill anymore. So uh, actually here for like Manor and Springlings, these are two lakes in the uh, city of Naples, you know, they actually are too high uh, for the what we call SCLT, which is soil cleanup target level. Uh, and you can see that they actually have much higher. So meaning that that sediment will have to be retreated and it double the cost of dredging. So uh, copper is a quick fix, but it also has repercussion very, very far away because that stays in the sediment and eventually get exported as well downstream. So we also have high level of arsenic, which is found in uh, the pesticide that they use to treat the pest all around <coughs> the pond. And sometimes, uh, so that's an idea of how it looks like in terms of um, muck. So it's very, my, call, my student call it uh, chocolate mousse. Uh, doesn't taste like so, doesn't smell like so, but uh, not, not very, very good. Uh, just as a comparison, you have next to it Lake Apopka. So it's about the same color. Lake Apopka is probably one of the worst lakes in Florida. Uh, you know, it has actually up to 12 or 18 feet of muck in some areas, so very, very bad. I didn't find anything like this here, but the muck actually that we found when, you, when we analyze it, the composition is actually worse than Lake Apopka for phosphorus and nitrogen, especially for phosphorus. And copper, of course, Lake Apopka didn't have any. Uh, so I'll pause this. This is just to show you the thickness. And this is not really pertinent here, but basically uh, I, I rank the lakes all among each other. So that was uh, something else. Oh, oh no. Okay, that's interesting. I still have, I still have a sound though. <laughs> you know, I noticed the guy work. I talked too long, they cut me off. I noticed the guy working on the generator earlier. I wonder if he had anything to do with it. I hope he's okay. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, uh, well, you can see. What you're saying is really exciting and important, so let's. Can we uh, so we I can actually have my little, I can actually finish before, you know, have, losing the thread of my ideas here. It'll take a while for projection. Yeah, so I will just... Get it recorded. Well, so can we, what, can, what can we do to prevent, you know, this? First, you know, we got to change our mind and look at ecosystem differently. You know, we are in the Everglades and it costs a lot of money and efforts and pollution to basically push the system into a, a place which are not supposed to be, meaning the glacial lake appearance, you know. Uh, they're supposed to have these algae during especially uh, at the end of the dry season and early rainy season, they're supposed to have these floating mats that come up to the surface. They're not dangerous, it might look nasty, but again, it's all perception because I love the Everglades, I work there all the time, and when I see these floating mats, I don't see them as bad scum, I see them as very healthy ecosystems, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that turf is not the only plant we can grow around, you know, uh, uh, we have especially all the plants, all the alternatives, and the, I work very closely with the Naples uh, Botanical Garden to find about plants that actually could be used as a subterfuge, uh, as an uh, alternative to these, you know, floratum plants. So that's very important as well. You know, we have native plants here that can take the abuse of the summer, and you know, we don't want monoculture. We want something that's mixed. You know, mixing is good, not monoculture. Um, then we have uh, the planting on the littoral zone. That's very important. You know, it's nursery for the fish. A lot of people don't understand. You know, I want bass. I say, but I don't want plants. Well, if you don't have plants, you won't have you know nursery for the young bass. You know, to be able to reproduce and, and find a refuge there. So um, this is very important as well. Um, also, when the the plants and the algae compete all the time. So that's something also that people don't understand. They, they compete for nutrient and light. So when you're planting plants, especially on a littoral zone, you actually have a, sh a canopy that you're making, and that canopy will prevent the algae, especially the bottom algae, from growing. All right, so that's another way we can do this. And the last one is uh, this flooding, flooding wetlands. Probably heard about it for some. Uh, it's a new technology that allows you to have a wetland filtration in your lake without having a wetland really in your property. So it's basically a floating... Um, a floating mat where you actually plant uh, hydroponically, so their, their roots are exposed in the water, uh, plants. And the plants basically have their root hanging in the water. When you see actually the, the island, you only see the tip of the iceberg. Here we go, it works bad. 
Um, here it is. So the only CTC is the tip of the iceberg, you know, actually underneath it, you actually have about nine tenths of the biomass, which is roots. And these roots are taking up the nutrients. And from our research, and then I did my, my, my graduate student, I found that these roots also excrete some chemicals that prevent algae bloom. So, you know, roots, uh, plants all the time compete with each other um, naturally with a root in the soil. Uh, but we found that when you put them in the water, they also continue to excrete these chemicals, and these chemicals have an action against uh, the growth, especially of cyanobacteria, these blue-green algae that can be very nasty. Uh, so we have that. We also have found that they also uh, are very good to, uh, as a protection for uh, very, very little fish. Uh, we actually originally wanted to see if we had zooplankton hiding there during the day and at night going out foraging, and we found none. But the reason is that all the fish actually love this island because they find a refuge there, uh, especially uh, during the day. And night they go out there forage. Um, so that was quite uh, interesting. And we're looking also at the, the, um, the fungus, or the fungi here, and the bacteria that grow on this root because they also have, um, you know, um, some, some usefulness here. So it's, it's interesting because it's a, it's, it's a, if Bill Mitch was, maybe you'll see him next, next, uh, next meeting. Uh, you know, he's a wetland ecologist, one of the most famous ones, but that's actually putting a wetland onto a lake um, and also having some planting, which attracts also wildlife like birds and et cetera. You know, they really love it. So um, what people do also is, uh, you know, when the plants are grown, they remove the plants and they plant it on their littoral zone. So they use that uh, island as a donor site to actually, uh, instead of mulching them, you know, you take the plant and you plant it around the, the littoral as well. So... To me, it looks like a win-to-win -win situation. And of course, you know, educating people is why I'm here. You know, not a lot of people know that there's, there's good and bad scum. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Great, thank you. I'm thank sure you. we'll have some questions later, but right. uh, we're gonna do all the presentations oh, oh, first. Oh, wait, I wanted oh, to show you something, just the last slide, which is something that is important. Is, uh, this is a progression that nobody's seen that before because I'm the only one actually started to do this, is to count how many lakes and how old they are and that takes a lot of time believe me but you can see that you know we had several uh, steps of increase of the number of these ponds uh, here uh, in, in southwest Florida and you do see a little slowdown after 2008 you know the down the turn down of the market but now it's coming back again so it's it's not exponential but it's it's growing so we have more of them and we want to, we want to do the right things Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Serge. Um, got a hard act to follow. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't bring a PowerPoint. I'm just going to talk for a little while, but I'll talk less than Serge did. My name is Wynne Abraham. I'm also on the faculty at FTCU. Um, I did, uh, my research interests are on the role of irregular events and how they shape the structure of um, ecosystems. So I've had opportunities to work in a variety of different ways, including anthropogenic changes to the landscape. Um, but I want to mention, I'm a Yankee. I did my undergraduate work in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan near Minnesota, and I'm really excited about the work that Serge is doing, because I used to say at um, public meetings that um, Minnesota's the land of 10,000 lakes, and we're becoming a land of 10,000 ponds. And it's really <laughs> interesting to see Serge's data support that. And my memory is that we had a bet as to who would be closest to that estimate, and I won, but I don't believe I ever got that beer. <laughs> I don't remember whether it was you or the students that owe me that beer, but um, it is exciting to see the work that Serge does. I know that a lot of us, a lot of you guys were here longer than I. Um, putting the university where it is was certainly controversial, and I like the fact that we're starting to fulfill that um, image of bringing really good scientists to the landscape, engaging local issues, and understanding better the systems that we're a part of. So I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that I was on Surge's search committee. <laughs> um, I mentioned that I'm an ecologist. I, I, I fear that I don't have all good data that, that Surge does. I fear that I'm going to raise more questions than I'll answer. I think that's in some ways inevitable. Um, the decisions that you guys are going to have to make can be based on science, but they really will be value-laden decisions. You're going to have to decide what the future of our landscape should look like. And at best, we'll be able to give you some insight into what the ramifications of some of those decisions are going to be. I mean, to take a simplistic example from Surge, if, the, if everybody who lives 
Um, and Bonilla Springs decides they really want these emerging important habitat features of stormwater ponds to be blue and look like the lakes that I saw in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and, and Minnesota. You can do that. We know how to do that. You pour poison into them, um, you kill them, you grow muck, and you um, restrict the ability for them to treat the nutrients that come through them. I would recommend not making that decision, but, but um, ultimately these are going to be value-laden political decisions. So um, this is the interactive part of my talk. How many of you guys remember the movie Armageddon with Bruce Willis? Can you put your hands up? Can, can everybody in the audience do that too? Do you guys remember Armageddon? Okay. So if you remember the story, it isn't really a doom and gloom one. Um, if you remember the story, an asteroid's going to hit the Earth and to be able to uh, get rid of the asteroid, they decide to send up a group of oil drillers in, in the space shuttle to get up there and, and put a nuclear bomb into it. And as they're in the space shuttle really ready to leave, one of the characters um, that's played by Steve Buscemi uh, makes this kind of um, uh, black comedy joke. And, and it, as they're waiting for the, the rocket to blast off, he says, how does it feel to be strapped to a rocket that has a quarter of a million moving parts all built by the lowest bidder? Right? And, and the point I want to make is um, that sounds like an incredibly complex piece of machinery that could be faulty. I think I'm accurate to say if you think about the size of this room and you took almost any natural system in Florida the size of this room, there's going to be more than a quarter of a million ants in it. Just ants. Let alone all the other life that's in it. So this particular metaphor is this adage that ecology is not rocket science. It's much more complicated than that. And I think it's really important for us to keep in mind. Um, these systems that you are considering how we will be managing um, are very complicated. We don't fully understand them. It'll take us a lot longer. And, and I'll sort of play with that metaphor a little bit. Um, I think some of what I'm going to say is obvious to you guys, but I don't know, you know, who, who all are listening on this land, on, on um, you know, over the television that that might use this sort of ecology 101 for Southwest Florida. The, the ecological, ecological challenges that we have in this landscape are largely driven by the fact that we came here, um, that we've come into a system that was functioning before we arrived, and we've changed that system, that very complicated system. I think fundamentally the the biggest change that we did was alter the hydrology. I think arguably, and maybe Jim will address this a little bit more, in the process of coming here, altering the hydrology, we've also introduced a lot of new species to the landscape that's sort of changing the rules of the game. Um, before we got here, rain would fall on this landscape, and the landscape would fill up. And the rain would leak off slowly, and would, it's OK, I don't have pictures. I can just keep going. Um, the land would, the water would leak off slowly. It would come out to the, um, the estuaries in a more measured and consistent flow. At the same time, that water that was held up higher in, the, in, in more upstream recharged the aquifers. And a lot of what happens when I imagine most of us who are, are humans of European extent, uh, descent arrived on this landscape is we didn't want that water on our fields or our roads. And so we um, changed the flow of water of the landscape largely by creating ways to drain off the water. We wanted to get it off the land quicker, not realizing how really valuable that water is. Um, and that's something that we're coming to find now. At, at a presentation on campus about 10 years ago, Ernie Estevez from Moat Marine um, came to give a talk about, it was actually about disturbance in estuaries. And he had this, he had this marvelous metaphor about the music of water in estuaries the timing, the frequency, and the rhythm of that. And, and his, his message was basically that we had disrupted that music on the landscape. So however you want to torture that metaphor, you know, in terms of how we introduced that disharmony and what that meant, you know, did we take people out of the orchestra? Did we put different people in? You know, did we create noise that drowns out that, that harmony? Um, we, we know that how it's manifesting itself in our landscapes is floods part of the time water shortages part of the time, exotic infestations that are probably um, uh, 
partly, maybe largely driven by those altered hydrologies, probably even changes to the historical pattern of fires across the landscape, all related to that idea of we put people here, and because we put people here, we changed um, where and when the water would be. So let me try to focus in a little bit tighter, but again, I'm not sure that I'm going to give you as many clear, clear cut guidances as, as Serge just did. Um, and think more about the DRGR, that, that you guys are thinking about how the policy will influence that. Water's really uh, the best physical manifestation of what I think is one of the fundamental laws of ecology is that we're all connected. And so whatever you guys are struggling with in terms of how you'll manage that part of the landscape is going to be constrained by what happens, what is upstream, and how the upstream systems are changed. That's just an ecological reality. And that whatever you decide would be the guiding principles for any changes within the DRGR um, can and probably will have profound impacts on everything downstream. The city, Estero Bay, Gulf of Mexico. So it's really important to think about that connection across the landscape. The river too, no doubt. Yeah, sorry, I skipped over the river column. You're right. Uh, so I imagine what you guys are, are struggling with, you know, I, I hear lots of debates about what DRGR means. You know, I always thought of it as density reduction, groundwater resources. Um, I, and if I just got the, the titles wrong, Jim's going to fix it, I promise, <laughs> when he gets up. I think it means, in my mind, it's meant that you thought about parts of the landscape where there will be fewer people, not necessarily no people, but fewer people, and that there's a real focus on stewardship of the water resources. How can we make sure that we're managing water there? And that's going to be tied up with the quality, the quantity of the surface water, the timing of the movement of that surface water, and the groundwater recharge. So let me um, wrap up my, my shorter presentation um, with what I think are guidelines to what you might consider. Where possible, fix the alterations on the landscape that have caused the landscape to drain too quickly. Wherever you have that opportunity, and it, and it makes sense in the larger context, try to fix that. I think you should be thinking about impoundments that will hold more water up in the landscape. I personally feel, and I don't think everybody agrees with this, that in some cases you might be holding more water on parts of the landscape than had happened historically because we've drained so much, and in some cases, we don't have the opportunity to repair those. But in that context, it's also important to make sure that we're not backing up too much water and further degrading some of the natural systems that are still there. We do have wetlands that, when they function as they had historically, are not wet all the time. They're seasonally wet. And if we back up water in the wrong places and lose more of the, that, those seasonal wetness, you know, I'd argue that we're again negatively impacting this music on the landscape. And practically what it means is there are species that are dependent on these um, seasonal wetlands for completing their life cycles. And we'll see cascading effects across the landscape if we lose too many of those. Um, if you guys are considering adding into this area impoundments, that would hold larger quantities of water for longer periods of time. Please talk with people like Serge about what the best management um, practices might be around those designs. So we can design things that will maximize the quantity of water that are held. I believe it would be much better to think about the ways of creating functional systems that will do a better long-term job of, of um, not just the quantity, but the quality and maybe the timing of that water. Um, I got to believe, this is my first time coming to this meeting, but I got to believe what you guys are really struggling with is some people's perception that there should be no new development in the DRGR and some people's perception that, um, that there should be, will be. Um, I, I, I tend to fall into that latter group of thinking, you know, there is going to be development. Um, DR doesn't mean density elimination, it means density reduction. And I think you have the opportunity, again, um, these are value-laden pieces, and I'm speaking from a place of being, having been on this landscape for less than 20 years, and I think I have, I hope I have adequate empathy for the people who grew up here and are really struggling with how much things have changed. I don't think people are going to stop coming here. I think our challenge is to figure out how to fit the people in in a more sustainable way. And so if you're going to be looking at um, 
the kinds of developments that are likely to happen or, or developing policy that will guide those developments, start thinking about those obvious things like less impervious surface and more green space. There is a real debate about does it make more sense to take a large piece of the landscape and concentrate all of the development to one area or to make it patches with more green space in between? That's a tough one. Different people will say different things about it. I think some of that comes from a fear that if you cluster development, it's just a first domino and that you're really not going to limit total development. You're just going to have a lot in one place and then you'll add a lot in another place and a lot in another place. So you've got to think about how to handle that. I think even in those places where you're clustering development, consider opportunities for um, small scale green space. I think uh, emerging is a deeper understanding of how um, physically and spiritually we're limited by not having access to the natural world. You know, even if it's small parks within more developed neighborhoods, consider how you might be able to fit that in and consider connectivity in that piece. Because if we're interested in maintaining biological diversity, we want to be able to make sure we're not isolating populations of, of species on the landscape. Um, sorry, I'm getting old. I got to get closer to my notes. Mm -hmm. um, I also do think, uh, you know, again, I've only been here for about 20 years, but I've seen increasingly the opportunity that if you are going to ha be having development on the landscape, that it can become leverage for being able to fund some of the other kinds of changes that you might want to do on the landscape. So the degree to which you might fit develop your policies to be able to help make that happen, because there are things we need to fix. There are things, and, and there are opportunities to be able to restore this landscape. And if you take into account the relatively large ignorance we have for these complicated systems that we're engaged in, that I'd encourage you to think about really building in policy relative to monitoring whatever kinds of um, decisions you make and being able to adapt over time. This is hard. I don't know all of you. I don't know which of you are here as citizens and which of you are here as part of a, the democratic process. Um, I know it's hard for people who are elected to admit mistakes. I guarantee you you'll make mistakes. It's just, we're going to make the best decisions, you're going to make the best decisions you can, and things will surprise us about what those things are. So the degree to which you can embrace that likelihood of making mistakes, I think, is good. Um, so I try to say that the systems that you guys are charged with giving some guidance as to how we are managed are, are really complicated. But um, I, I do believe, I, you know, maybe I'm naive and as a teacher I have to have this attitude. Um, I think we can restore the music. I think we can fit people better into this landscape than we have historically as we learn more as we change those things. I think our ability to find that future where we can live more sustainably on this landscape, more in harmony, is a function of our willingness to explore alternatives, to make thoughtful decisions, and being willing to, mis to um, admit our mistakes and adapt. And I thank you guys all for the efforts that you've done so far and the ones that you're going to continue to be engaged in. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just for clarification, we get to advise city council and they make the decisions. So if it's a good, we, we've advised them well. If it's bad, it's their fault that they implemented oh. it. So. <laughs> yeah. So. We've already got that figured out. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll see if we can get my presentation up on the okay. computer. I'm Jim Beaver. I'm with the Southwest Florida Regional Planning Council. If you take a look at your um, agenda that's listed as SWRPC, that's S it should be SWFRPC. Um, the SFRPC is over in the East Coast, and they know very little about nature. I <laughs> I'll, I'll claim responsibility for that one. They actually think they're going to address sea level rise by building a giant fortress around Miami Beach. <laughs> so I've been invited to come and talk to you about a project that we're just starting um, that we're contracted with the um, city of Bonita Springs to do, which is the Spring Creek Restoration Plan. And this concentrates on the Spring Creek watershed. So part of this gets into some of your um, DRGR at the very northern end, but we're looking through the whole system from the bay along the whole system all the way up to that, that area. This is the outline of our steps. It's a 14 month process. This is one of those slides, it's, the print's too small. But I've, um, also you have copies, I believe, of the 
um, overall project that we're doing, and it involves a lot of public participation. And what we're undertaking is looking at all the aspects of Spring Creek and concentrating in four, um, four areas. It's hydrology, it's water quality, the estuarine creek and riparian habitats along the creek, and human access to the creek, uh, both in terms of the existing access that's there today and opportunities for new access for things like kayaking and canoeing and um, you know, the chance for people in the city to enjoy Spring Creek and uh, have it as part of their integrated system rather than that thing that's at behind the development somewhere that um, kind of doesn't make any connection so they have to all go out to the main road and go over a bridge and go back to the other place. Um, and it's interesting when you think about it that to a large extent Florida grew up around its rivers and streams and that was the way people used to get around in Bonita Springs in the Stero. Um, when I was a kid growing up on Pine Island we'd just be as inclined to get in a boat to go to a store or a restaurant and avoid the long drives over rather rickety roads and creosoted wooden bridges. And it wasn't uncommon at that time, Sanibel didn't, you have a, didn't even have a bridge to it. And you know, there, was, there were school boats, there were mail boats, um, and it's still a way that we could get around to a certain extent or at least enjoy the environment that we're in. And I often wonder, as I look in you know, Bonita Springs today, how disconnected some of these places have become where people are essentially living in an environment that is temperature controlled in a building, going to a temperature controlled vehicle to another temperature controlled building. And even to a large extent, they've never been on any of the tributaries within the city. If they go on a boat, they head out to the Gulf of Mexico and don't spend too much time here. And quite frankly, inshore fishing was all we ever did. We, we never messed with all that stuff that was out in the deep gulf. It, was, it wasn't as tasty. Um, the watershed for Spring Creek is the smallest of your watersheds in the system. And in part, it's because it um, used to be twice the size that it is today. It got cut off when they built Interstate 75. Um, it's 10 miles in size. Um, and it basically runs around two miles wide, five miles long from the uh, Stero Bay up to about the interstate with a few very small culvert connections right at that north end. Um, what's interesting too is in just 10 years, the population in that watershed increased 52.16%. It's your most urbanized watershed in the city. And it really shows when we take a look at it in um, some aerials. Um, the creek itself, as you know, enters in from Estero Bay. It takes a turn to the south, goes through some rather um, pleasant and extensive mangrove wetlands. It's a very braided creek. We had had the benefit of it not being visited by the Army Corps of Engineers or anyone um, that decided to change it. And then once you get past the US 41 and the railroad bridges, it starts becoming heavily channelized and it was broken into a series of right angled turns through a number of the subdivisions. Heading further up, and I don't know if I have a pointer here, I think I do. The real watershed for the creek is up and up. Oh. Well, when I hit the pointer, I think my, f my finger's too big for, okay, thank you. My large hands came into play. The real watershed for it was up in this flint pen strand, and it flowed in this general direction in two branches if we go back to old historical aerials. And one of the things we're going to look at in the study is whether we can reestablish some of those connections. Another thing we're going to look into is the spring. Um, you know, at one time, we had a number of springs connecting to a number of our tributaries along this coast, and there was an activity by the Water Magic District to cap and plug these artesian springs um, and concerns about water supply. They weren't exactly fresh water springs, but they, they weren't full marine waters or estuarine waters. A lot of them were somewhat alkaline. Um, but we'd like to look into this. Um, the last spring I was aware that they, we capped here in the Bonita Springs area was actually in that central slough of Bonita Bay. Um, so it's, it's something to think about and, and we'll examine in the course of the study. Um, I've got some preliminary work. This is some stuff we did this week, looking at the five-year running uh, water quality for Spring Creek. Uh, basically, the um, 
Levels of chlorophyll have gotten better within the creek. The average in the estuarine is down about 31 percent, although we've had a higher peak than in the past when we had an algae bloom within the creek at about 49 percent over what we had in the past. In the freshwater spring creek, the chlorophyll levels, this is a sort of integrative indicator of nutrient inputs uh, as expressed with typically an alg algae in the water column, down about 69 percent and the peaks down about 45 percent. This is over the last five years. Um, the oxygen levels are, are declining slightly in the estuarine system and up a little bit in the, in the fresh water. Um, now, these aren't really enough to get too much of a concern. By the way, the red lines here are the standards that we should be achieving. We'd like our oxygen levels in the case of this graph to be above that red line. But the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, is likely to redefine what the oxygen standards are for Florida waters in the near future and probably say they're not going to be concerned about this. But it should be higher than this. I mean, we, we expect it would be, but we are seeing improvements. And I think there are reasons we're seeing improvements in the watershed, and I'll discuss that towards the conclusion of the presentation. One clear problem, though, is fecal coliform, which is an indication of inputs of um, waste resources. Now, this can come from people. This can come from wildlife. But I think there's a lot more people than wildlife in the Spring Creek watershed today. Um, and so we've gotten about a 53% increase in the estuarine and over a 234% increase going on in the uh, freshwater system. So we need to figure out where this is coming from. There's a number of possible sources and among them are um, fertilizers which have animal waste as, as a base within them, um, septic systems, um, leaky um, central systems, packaged treatment plants and um, actually domestic pets if in concentration. Um, interesting though, if you're in a very urban area, they, they, they had a study up in a, a more urban part of the state with cities and down, underground sewers, and they found that a large part of their fecal coliform was coming from the rats living in their uh, drainage system. Okay, um, I don't think that's a problem for Bonita Springs then. The um, total nitrogen has been increasing um, this may be associated, and the two may be linked if we're looking at a fertilizer source. 42% in the estuarine, 54% in the freshwater. So um, that's some, a matter of some concern, but it also could be in part from what Serge was talking about earlier, that we're now getting discharging stormwater treatment systems. But phosphorus is down, um, about 4% in Spring Creek, about 35% in the fresh water. And I think some of the ch positive changes we're seeing here in some of the areas is related to our stricter fertilizer ordinances, which have been adopted in our part of the state, particularly the no phosphorus in summer fertilizer standard that we have for, for this region and the city has adopted based on recommendations that came from the Regional Planning Council. So I think you're seeing some positive successes from this in regard to the Spring Creek watershed. Uh, turbidity is doing okay. Um, you, even though it isn't as clear as it had been running historically, you're way below the turbidity standards. And so, and in fact, if you take a look at your different water bodies, your river, riparian water bodies along Estero Bay, it's one of our clearest of the- uh, we want to be below the line. Yes, you want to be below. The only one you want to be above the red line is oxygen. Okay. Hmm. Um, looking at the hydrology of the creek, it is really jumpy or um, flashy. Um, natural systems, if you take a look before a number of modifications done to our watershed earlier in the 80s, and I'm, I know some of you have been here a very long time. I grew up on Pine Island. I know that it used to be once you got past Edison, it was just green space until you got to the top of Naples. And all, most of this was agricultural. There were some homesteads. People had concentrated around the fish houses and so forth. Old 41. So back in the 80s, you can see that you would go up and down. But overall, the curve's pretty smooth, wet season, dry season. Then as you started <coughs> compartmentalizing the watershed. So during the dry season, water was held back and be below the control structures. And then once you hit the control structures, all the water gets released at the same time. Then you start developing these flashy hydro periods where it's a lot of fresh water and short pulses, 
then drops down to hardly no fresh water. That's not easy on a creek, particularly when you have animals trying to make a living in salinities that are about half salt and half fresh. A lot of our small fishes, our game fishes, the redfish, the snook, all of them like these conditions where you get about 15 parts per thousand or half the salinity of seawater. And so this makes it less good fish habitat, less good habitat for a lot of organisms within those creeks. <coughs> you do see the effect of some of the hurricane years here, but not as strongly as we see in some of the other water bodies like the Peace River. Looking a little bit later into our time frame, that was um, the 80s to 06, now 99 to 03. Some of that flashiness has decreased. You can see that drought around 07, but it's still there. And we'd like to take a look at some things we might be able to do with Spring Creek in terms of filter marshes, in terms of retention systems, in terms of um, more gradual water delivery systems that might be able to even out your hydro period in the course of the study. So we're in the first month of a 14 month project. We just got started. And um, right now we're gonna be meeting with the uh, City of Bonita Springs staff, introduce the project, talk about what they perceive as a restoration need, what vulnerabilities they see, and what potential things they think we might be able to do. But we're gonna have a whole series of public meetings and have the input from everybody that's associated with the Spring Creek watershed and adjacent to it and take their input. Ultimately, our deliverable is going to be a Spring Creek restoration plan. And we're gonna talk about all the things you might be able to do reasonably to address these um, different issues of hydrology, water quality, habitat, and access. And then leave it to the city to look at those alternatives as to which ones they might want to select to do. The team is composed of myself, Dave Crawford, a new fellow that joined up with us, Jay McLeod, and Tim Walker, who will do our GIS work. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. I'm sure we've all got a bunch of questions for everybody, so uh, anybody want to start? I have a question. Please. Um, Go ahead and swing your microphone towards you. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, one in, is in regard to um, the percentage of wetland that's now in ponds. I mean, I, I think that that's sort of a bit what you were showing was what, what this all used to be pretty much wetland. So now it's become um, more of a pond situation um, and they're isolated, obviously not all touching each other. And if we're looking at a, at an area like the DRGR, I'm not sure what sort of developing policies are within our, um, the city meaning, to, to say, oh, okay, can, can, is it actually possible to say within a city, within an area like the DRGR, okay, we can't, no turf, um, no use of copper, no, uh, you're required to have, I mean, can you require these things? It's a question of, yeah, and I know one of the things we're, we're um, advocating at the uh, state level is not implementing state-mandated restrictions on fertilizer, allow the municipalities, because every municipality is different, to regulate the amount of fertilizer use and things of that nature. So we, we, we certainly could as a city. So it is possible within the city? It is possible. Okay. I, and I was wondering the same thing in regard to testing and, um, you know, if, if you test these retention areas and find out that the, the nitrogen level is off the charts, Obviously, that nitrogen's going somewhere. I would venture to guess that it's going to eventually get into the creek systems and, and river okay. systems here. And, and then the second question I had was actually in direct regard to FGCU. But I was just able to go over there. I have a son that's in grad school there. And um, he gave us a tour. Both my kids went there before, so I'm seeing a lot of changes there. And one of the big things that I noticed were two things. Around all the buildings now, they have the rocks so that all the rain that comes off the roofs goes through all the rocks. And I thought that was really neat. And the second thing was of, I've always been fascinated with the number of bridges over the wetlands that the students all transport themselves either by walking or skateboarding and everything. And I just love the way it's got so many kids there now and yet it's still so incorporated in such a natural way with so much wetland around it. 
So how expensive or difficult is that to maintain those systems with a student population of, I think that it's over 12,000 now, and a lot of them are residents. So if one of you could address that, I know that the idea of setting it up that way, but if we're looking at some um, way of, of bringing more natural areas that the public can enjoy, I think that that's a really neat way of looking at it. I mean, the way that FGCU has done it, you're getting all around town, so to speak, and yet you've got all this life going on all around you. And is that, I can see it's expensive to set up, but is it also expensive to maintain? Is that it? Sorry, but I'll, I'll once again not have really good numbers for you. Um, I think rate, um, is Kevin Irwin currently contracted with the city for doing some of the work on the DRGR? He is. Because a lot of the original design came from Kevin's vision for the university. So he might even have those numbers at his fingers if you, the next time that you get him in, in here. Um, I think the degree to which it is minimized is because of the uh, amount of green space. The campus is still over 50% undeveloped. Um, we're fighting over you know, the final little pieces and we might fall below 50 to down to 49% or depending on how you calculate other land that we're getting, we may stay over 50%, but that's still tremendously high compared to most guidelines. I don't know how to answer your first question. I would hope that you guys have the opportunity to make um, broad and diverse suggestions to the town council about what those guidelines might be, and I would think amount of green space is probably okay. If you haven't been there it, recently especially, it's surprising the number of kids that are just all over that place, yeah. and yet how it's integrated into a system of, of so much. I mean, you're constantly going through natural areas and. Yeah. It, and yet they're they're just hubbubbing like a university. We're, you know, um, I think the design was good. I mean, you yeah. saw how it was sort of integrated, catching uh, rainwater, uh, losing the energy from the rainwater to minimize runoff, maximizing um, detention areas, mm -hmm. including a lot of native vegetation that slows down and absorbs nutrients. So I think it's a pretty good fix. We are spending money now. I don't have the numbers on some management of the ponds, particularly with um, cattails coming in and getting really dense. And so we're, we're spending some time removing those. Um, I'm, that's nice because a piece from my notes that I forgot is to say you got to think about whatever you build, there's going to be long-term management associated with it. Right. I'm making the case, and maybe Serge would disagree, that what we have to start planning for the time that we're going to be demucking those lakes if we want them to continue to function as stormwater retention and treatment areas. So. Um, it isn't free, nothing is. Right. I think that smarter design minimizes the long-term cost, but I don't have the exact numbers for you, but maybe Jim does. I was involved with the um, review of the selection of all the different university sites of which 22 were nominated. When the one that we were left with was selected, which was the third worst of the 22 sites, <laughs> the design of the university there is not the design you see today. We had to, and by way I mean a lot of different people working together, get this design that you have today into its format with about 50% preserve and 50% developable area. It was pointed out to the university people they did not have a lot of developable area on that site. Um, it was, had significant amount of fill to bring up what areas are upland there today significant expenses to put the utilities out there, significant expenses to build the road network to reach it. Um, and so what you see today there where there's the integration is because regulatory efforts insisted that the university do the right thing if it was going to be the environmental university. And there was resistance every step of the way. And I can tell you there have been five different times we've had to dispute with the university when they've wanted to go into preserve areas to further expand their structures on that property and I don't expect that it will stop. They didn't really get the best site for the amount of what they wanted to do and that's why they're doing some other locations and ultimately I expect that the overall FGCU is going to have multiple locations to have enough uplands to be able to do the things that they want to do if we're successful in keeping the design that you see there today. But it is an interesting example of um, integrating a lot of people into an area 
and yet still maintaining a, a working um, ecosystem and and uh, it's just it's beautiful and it's well done and it, it it surprised me the the condition of the ponds and everything it was very healthy and just to follow along on that and uh, I know that it was controversial to put the university out in the middle of the wetlands uh, and I think that controversy is going to continue as far as expansion but one of the elements to that plan my understanding is they they really tried to design it so that you weren't digging a lot of areas down and lowering your water table you're trying to keep everything uh, float your development uh, is what the way that Kevin Irwin described it floated on top of the wetlands not lower the water table not dig out a lot of the wetlands to create the fill and I think that that you also see that when you're out there of that horizon of you know not hills and and valleys but really that level landscape and I think that that might be one of the things that we should look at as far as the the Bonita DRGR and making sure that anything that happens out there uh, tries to get your groundwater levels as close as possible to historic levels by doing things like floating the water because if you raise the water table you're helping both with water quality, flood control, fire prevention, uh, and creating a, a better system. Right, because I think that that's the thing that disturbs me about the current form of growth within the DRGR and um, what helped to get me involved in this is just one pad, one pond, one pad, one pond, you know, and it just constantly digging to fill, to dig to fill, to dig to fill, one per <coughs> five acres, and that just sprawling disturbance. Um, it, it is, this is interesting, yeah. Did you have something to add? Yeah, well, I did, I'm sorry, and I wasn't no, sure how this ahead. worked. Yeah, um, please. Jim will tell me later if I shouldn't have been putting words in his mouth, but you know, one uh, piece of advice you could draw from Jim's perception third worst, worst site and some marvelous things have been done with it. The siting of the university was controversial. Uh, you must all know that whatever you decide to do in the DRGR will be controversial, but don't let that um, blind you to the possibility. Thank you. Fred? Well, <clears throat> I had a question of both these speakers. Um, F GCU did do a great job with the third worst site. But when they built there, and they did were good, as good a stewards as you can be, Kevin Irwin was involved in it. What happened to all those other thousands of acres that got opened up by the development of SDCU? Don't tell me it's of the same standards because it ain't. Okay. The worst site is now part of a national park. The second no, worst. I'm not talking about the site that, F the, that the university owns. I'm talking about all that commercial okay. development that followed. Oh, yeah, well. That area got blown open. Right, well, the fact of the matter is that the whole point of the university being put there by the landowner who donated the land was so that all the other land he owned around there would be developed. Right. And that's what happened. And that's, so what that's, ha now, and that's why you've got Miramar Lakes and all the other things. Was that level of the university? That's my question. No, they were not. That's right. And um, basically, the university was held to a higher standard through what's called a DRI process. Right. And we don't, um, interestingly enough, now universities aren't required to do DRIs. They get to govern themselves. So um, they got themselves opted out of that by the Florida legislature. But the fact of the matter is, is that that was the, the university was the first bite into the DRGR. And then they got the DRGR line moved around them. And then there was supposed to be University Village. And everything around that university was supposed to be development which would serve the university. And the president of the university was given the option of vetoing anything that was being proposed that didn't serve the university but he never exercised that veto on anything that was proposed around the university. So the university had the opportunity to influence the type of development which occurred around it, but it ended up instead with what you see there today by accepting everything that was proposed. Um, the laws were followed. 
once the university was there, it became increasingly difficult to put any further restriction on what was happening on the very similar lands and the very similar places. And the Lee County Comprehensive Plan was continually amended to allow the further movement of development eastward. And that's all, this is all just a matter of history. Right. Um, to a large extent, people worked to try to establish as much preserved land as possible um, where it was pertinent. We did maintain, and it's always been a goal, under the Regional Wildlife Habitat Plan and the Watersheds Plan to maintain that slough which runs through FGCU and interconnects over further to the east and then further up to the north and, and into the crew areas. So that slough has been maintained. But um, the standardized development format was followed once you had gone to the east of the interstate. Good. Thank you. If I can add to that. Um, I don't even think you should say the university has done a good job of developing the site. I think that Jim's perception is 100% correct. I think that the people who were charged with guiding that process from the outside did a good job of forcing my bosses to often do the thing they didn't want to do. At, you know, um, President Merwin did exercise his veto, but not as a veto. He said, um, build Gulf Coast Town Center because it will provide shopping, recreation, and jobs for our faculty, staff, and students. That was his image. So, so again, I think what you guys can think about is that if you start to have a shared image of what should happen in the DRGR, the ability for you to influence the future to bring that shared image about is really going to be how much you constrain other people who might have a different image. And that's just the reality. You know that that um, different people are going to have a different vision of the future, right. and and uh, and and don't be surprised by that. But that's one, the city's one, that's the city's responsibility, correct? They 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 draw up the the ordinances and the. That's like that university presence responsibility. Yeah, it is. But now let me ask one other question. Sure. The water retention within the site of FGCU. Is it at a higher level of standard than what you could have done if you just followed the regulations of South Florida Water Management and Lee County? Uh, Jim probably knows the truth of this. I've heard that in two different ways. Kevin will, was involved in that too. It was my understanding that the, um, the water retention is higher than it had been, but, I, but my bet would be that wasn't because anybody at my institution said, let's do the absolute right thing. It was that somebody put, up, put that higher standard on there to try to create a new um, target for the landscape. So um, I, don't, I don't, sometimes I struggle with my bosses who have a different image than I do, but I try to recognize that um, they have a different image than I do. And, and you know, they, they grew the institution, they see directions they want to take it. Um, I think. If that's correct, uh, Jim will fix it if I got it wrong. Um, when's correct that the university had a higher standard that was prevalent in general development at the time? Kevin Irwin did a good job with the stormwater management system, and um, what Ms. Johnson mentioned was exactly the case where they tried to retain a um, st what they call a stage, an elevation for the wetlands and for the water there, which was the natural stage of elevation for the wetlands rather than lowering it so that the ground floor elevations of bu buildings could be at a lower elevation. So that was a good, it was ultimately a good design. Um, the reason in part that design was there is because it was a DRI review process. The Water Magic District, the South Florida Water Magic District asked for better uh, treatment levels and it was provided in the design Kevin Irwin put together. Thank you. And just a reminder for everybody, I mean, we can focus and talk about FGCU all day, but it's, it, these gentlemen are here really to talk about low impact design standards, best management practices, how do we treat exotics. Um, so I mean, we, if we want to have a separate discussion about what they do specifically at FGCU, I think we should probably no, save my, that for my, another My day. point was just as to, because of not having a, any background in development at all, trying to figure out what, if we're going to have certain standards, which we've talked a lot about, what is, what, not only what are we able to recommend or, ask for but what is the city legally actually allowed to implement on an area like is it is it technically fair to say that within the drgr you have to have a certain amount of planting and you can't use any copper and yet another part of the city 
I, I don't know the answer to that question, that, and those questions, and I don't really see a lot of point in, in having a lot of dreams um, about things that wouldn't it be great if we could to, to bring them to a city level and then find out, no, you can't. Yeah, and Audrey had an appointment, so she can't answer this, but if I, if I were Audrey, I would say that every, you can do anything, everything has a cost. Right. So to the, extent, I mean, to the extent we suggest to the city council to allow nothing to happen with any piece of property anywhere in the city, we can do that. They can implement that. However, there's a cost to it in terms of lawsuits and loss of land use. So even so, if you say you can't have any turf in the DRGR, if you... Well, you go, if you, that's part of best management practices and low impact design standards that we implement. And but does that you, cause a lawsuit? No. Uh, <laughs> again, if, if we, sorry, without getting into the, the specific recommendations, generally speaking, the answer is Yes, by creating, for example, overlay districts, you can fashion okay. certain regulations for one area that are not consistent with certain regulations in another area. So that is possible. When we dive a little bit deeper into the specific recommendations, there may be complications. But generally speaking, yes, you can look at FGCU and say there were certain development practices and management practices that we would like to incorporate here. Can we do that just here? Yes. Okay. I'd can like I? to ask one questions. more question, if I could. Is it <clears throat> this one is primarily directed to Surge, but the other two uh, speakers who are very uh, technically competent as well, feel free to chime in. I know you did a lot of work on uh, ponds, both wet and dry, and what, what good impacts they can have as well as some of the problems. How do, generally, how do the retention ponds and dry ponds relate or which is better the where you have large tracts of land that just through mother nature have large quantities of water standing on them in the wet season versus the the ponds i'm talking about hundreds of acres you know of water standing not 10 acre pond or 20 acre is there is there much data on that I don't know. I, ha I don't have the answer, but uh, I think when I started to to talk, I said that I would rather see a lot of wetlands rather than detention retention ponds because wetlands do a better job. You know, wetlands are the kidneys of our systems, and they do a better, better job to to clean the water efficiently. And I, I wish uh, uh, Bill Mitch were, were here because uh, he's actually designed stormwater detention pond, uh, stormwater um, treatment areas. Um, which are, you know, impounded, impoundment to actually um, keep the water a little while until it's clean enough to be released to, uh, to the natural system. Um, when I came here, I, originally my postdoc was on a stormwater treatment area south of Lake Okeechobee. So these are area designed to use uh, plants and algae to polish the water so that you reach that 10 part per billion phosphorus in the water limit so they can be actually released to the natural system. So, I mean, I mean to me, that a pond is not really the, the answer to, to clean the water, but how do we um, tell people you're going to live on a wetland? That's another ballgame. You know, they all want to have a lake front view property, uh, not a wetland front view property. I had a couple of questions while we got Serge there. Please. Uh, unless you're not. I'm done. Oh. Uh, real quick, that when you looked at your different pond design criteria, did you look at depth? The You know, there's been this back and forth over yes. the years of shallow, then they grow cattails, and then deeper. Yes. Uh, 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 the That's a big issue. Uh, the person who actually designed this pond, Harvey Harper, um, when I talked to him at the meeting, actually I presented that uh, presentation I showed you today, told me that uh, he would rather actually see them dug at deeper. So, so the, more, bad, more the, the bad lakes you had, were they shallow or deep lakes? Uh, it depends. Some of them are, you know, deep, deep, and some of them are shallow, but uh, in limnology, I would characterize, and limnology being my uh, science of study of lakes, would be shallow lakes. They're also shallow lakes. Um, if you're too shallow in Florida, especially when you have limestone uh, environments, when you're dug into the limestone, you have too much light penetration. And when you have this, you uh, have a lot of vegetation growing on the bottom, which I like, but most people don't. 
um, so including algae as well. You know, these, these algae that grow on the bottom and tend to float on the surface. When you have shallow lakes, that's what happens. You know, they, they grow on the bottom and then suddenly they, they, they float as big mats and cover the entire pond. You don't see the water anymore. Um, so that's why one of the reasons they would like to dip it deeper as well. And then the other reason to dip to dug them deeper would be to have more uh, buffering capacity for the nutrient to be dissolved into. And then how about the, the dredging? Did you look at how long, say, a typical lake that was in a development before it should be dredged or might need to be dredged? Or yeah. Uh, the pond I studied uh, in Naples, they are over 50 years old. They've never been dredged. Uh, sincerely, haven't seen a lot of ponds here that have been dredged. Uh, the way Harbor Harper designed them say that they have to be drained between 15 and 20 years. Uh, I haven't seen that happen. In general, the pond I have seen dredged were 50 years plus. Mm. Um, there is a, a, a ratio between the, the amount of muck and the volume in the surface area that you have to reach uh, to decide if you want to dredge, but um, that's a very, uh, uh, very engineering way to look at it. I uh, look at it in different ways is ecologically, you know, uh, you also have to look at what the the muck contains in terms of inorganic versus organic versus nutrient uh, that's that's important too uh, that's something that is often occulted so to also answer more specifically to your question when do you need to dredge it all depends on what we call the the loading so right. if you have a lot of nutrient nutrients mean a lot of organic matter that will grow a lot of organic matter that would be killed by different means that would set him on the bottom and then that organic matter is sucking all the oxygen through the bacterial uh, respiration. So, so that's also another thing. And then you, you can also have ponds that feel very quickly because you have a lot of uh, shoreline erosion. That's completely different. The so pond can be very healthy in terms of water quality, but they have a lot of sand and silt on the bottom, so the pond becomes very shallow. And then, you know, ultimately, they're supposed to turn into wetlands if we leave them this way, because that's, that's what uh, all lakes and, and, uh, do. So basically, if we're... If it depends on what's around the pond. Yes. More than just even... The, the management has a, a... We can look at it as a as a, um, a time machine. Not a time machine, not wrong. Um, like a clock. Uh, the more nutrients you have, the faster the clock ticks. The less nutrient, the slower it, it ticks. So the more time you have before you have to dredge. If you have a very healthy pond, it will, over time get into the process what we, which we call eutrophication, meaning nutrient enrichment, but it's a very slow and long process. I mean, we were talking 100 years, I don't know. Plus, if you're cutting the grass around the pond and then the water table comes up and all the grass clippings are left. Yeah, these are best management practices that right. have to be in, in place. But again, uh, oh, the other thing I haven't talked to you guys about today, and that's something I'm investigating, is some of these ponds, like the pond on campus, we, know we, we don't fertilize, uh, we actually don't really orient the way the grass is growing. Whatever grows, grows. I mean, we did have an uh, original seeding with uh, grasses, but now it's a mixture of everything. But when we look at the water quality, the water quality is still eutrophic, meaning nutrient-rich. And uh, some of my research now um, especially focus on the groundwater interaction <coughs> with the pond, since they actually are directly in connection with the groundwater. And what we found is that you actually have tremendous amount of water coming from the groundwater, and this is what groundwater is polluted, whether it's probably from upstream. Like say you have a golf course on the other side of the road and the water is flowing in, the, in your direction, you're getting some of these nutrients as well. Uh, there were several actually studies that I'm not sure were stopped or um, maybe it was not good politics to show these results, but. Uh, uh, when I talk to a few people, I will name them. They say, oh, yeah, I, I did that. And, you know, the nutrient, nutrient in particular, I have to measure. I had to deal it 20 times to be able to measure it. That's how, you know, being in a university and not being tied to politics, I could allow myself to do this on actually every, every CU money. But I'm not sure because the problem we have here is that whatever, if, if we do the right thing all the time, um, would my pond still be healthy? I don't have the answer yet. So uh, I'm studying that on six different ponds right now, including Lake Trafford, which is a natural lake. And just to follow on that, uh, this concept of the groundwater being connected to some of these ponds, <coughs> I know in the lead DRGR, there are a lot of homes that are planned around mine pits. Mm -hmm. And those pits are used as part of the stormwater management. 
if you have a large pollutant load from the grass clippings, fertilizers, all of that going into the pits that may be getting contamination from offsite and going through to another site, do you have data on how Not all of now, that? but as I speak, we actually try to put together a, a proposal for Miramar Lakes. Uh, Miramar Lakes was, uh, you know, it also a, a, a mine, a uh, pit lake, and uh, the lake turned turbid, turbid recently, and uh, they had a problem with hydrilla, which is an invasive in Florida. And um, they couldn't actually kill hydrilla using algae side because the lake is very hard water, and the hydrilla is uh, growing with um, a sheath of calcium carbonate made of algae and just, just calcium carbonate precipitation. And when we use algae side, we cannot actually kill that uh, hydrilla. So what they decided is to add actually grass carp. And now that's all speculation. Uh, but we assume that the grass carp actually, they use the highest recommended rate, and they can do this every year, all right? Because some will die, and we're not sure how many, so we can use it every year. So they basically have a high load of grass carps, which eats grass. And uh, even though the triploid, you know, since you added more, you have a lot of them. And now we have seen, you know, no, no hydrilla pretty much, but we've also wiped out all the good native underwater vegetation. And um, the lake actually turned very turbid now because um, when you're missing all the, hydrilla, uh, all the, the plants in the littoral zone now, it's subjected to wind or suspension. And now the lake turned very, very turbid. And when you kick mud, you're actually releasing nutrient, and now they have algae bloom. And uh, my students actually uh, went there this year to dive to, for the diving certification. And in the past, they were able to see each other, and they were just next to each other, and they lost each other. So the lake turned very, very bad and very, very quickly. Um, to respond more specifically about your question about nutrient, is, uh, since uh, these are mine lakes, they have a lot, a lot of water. So you, know, you need to have a lot, a lot of nutrient to get out nutrient get a higher concentration uh, to really have a change in your system. So, um, you know, there's a, always that juggle between volume and dilution and concentration that you got to play with. But when you have a lot of groundwater, especially if it's polluted, I think that you have a problem. Yeah. When you want to add? Yeah, yeah Jim, you want to add more stuff? I right? do. <laughs> I wanted to try to go back to your question, Fred, and truthfully, it's exactly what Scott said. There's always going to be a trade-off between cost. So. Um, if you ask my opinion, and I would say that we're, Surge is helping to plug this empirical gap, but I'll, we just don't understand enough about these systems yet. I'd rather see a shallow pond thick with native vegetation than a deeper pond, in my opinion. And I'd rather see a shallow seasonal wetland if it could do the same job. But each of those will require larger footprints, which has, a neg which has an impact on the cost-benefit analysis for a particular development site. Uh, as the result of one of the problems that my institution had in terms of living up with following regulations in 2004, the DEP funded a project for us to look at ponds. We finished that up in 2005. We studied, I think it was 22 or 23 lakes throughout Lee County for a year. One of the conclusions we drew from that was um, we thought around 30 years might be an expected time to be able to demuck a lake, but it was exactly what Serge said, was that um, it was profoundly impacted by the management and the habitat around that lake. You know, you, you pump more nutrients in, you'll get a faster accumulation of muck, and you're going to have to demuck sooner if you want the lake to continue to function as uh, sequestering the nutrients that run off the landscape. If you're OK with the lake ceasing to work, after three or four decades, then we can continue to build them and, and manage them poorly. Well, it's ceasing to work. They're still a, a, an aesthetic thing, but the problem is when they're adding yeah. phosphorus and nutrients into yeah. the system. And at some level, they can even cease to be aesthetic. I'm trying to remember the meeting we were having about water resources where somebody said, nothing ruins a marketing plan better, more effectively than the smell of dead fish. <laughs> you know, if they're not functioning as, you know, as uh, healthy ecological systems, they'll be functioning as unhealthy ones. And you'll get those boom busts, you know, and, and dead fish floating in your backyard, and, and yeah. nobody wants to buy that. 
Gwen, is there any alarm yet about the issue with the copper? That sounds like that could turn into a worse problem. And Jim or Serge might know. I mean, that, that is things that are going downstream. Uh, certainly, as we go back to trying to better manage these lakes long term and demucking them, we're going to have to deal with that. Yeah. Copper is elemental. It's not going to go anywhere. No, and it's going to take um, the cost and, up so high. Yeah, and, it sounds yeah. like and, I, and I know here's a cost, too. Some people make their business in managing lakes that way. Yeah. Um, but that you know that's one of the cases where I think, you know, Serge is right. You're creating chemical dependent lakes and that ultimately it's going to have a negative impact downstream ultimately yeah. okay I'm going to address a number of the different questions that di different folks had here I've been doing a three-year study on filter marshes and we're actually in an area where a lot of entities have built filter marshes for water quality treatment purposes in order to meet their basin management action plans to uh, reduce the non attainments under the TMDLs, the total maximum daily loads for water bodies. Lee County is a leader in this. <clears throat> in the course of the study, it's very clear, looking at the literature, the type of work that Surge has done, other people have done, that a filter marsh, or as he mentioned, the stormwater treatment area, is much more effective at treating for nitrogen and phosphorus than any of the stormwater lake systems. It's a much more efficient at taking the nutrients out, and it's maintained, will continue to do so over its entire life. And it's designed for nutrient removal. We have several of these in this area. If you'd like to visit them, Freedom Park down in Naples is a beautiful example of one. The 10 Mile Canal Filter Marsh, which also has a bike path along it. Um, recently, they put one on Briarcliff Canal associated with the extension of the road. Um, Powell Creek has one in North Fort Myers. There's another one on Billy's Creek. These are very, very effective, and they're a much better way if you want to treat for nutrients, particularly nitrogen, phosphorus, total suspended solids. They also do good with fecal coliform than a stormwater pond. With regard to depth of ponds, um, quite frankly, Harvey Hopper is wrong. And we've examined his whole plan and his whole working system. Um, we looked at it over many years, and by we, I mean not just myself, but other people who work in the field the Estero Bay Agency on Bay Management. He basically uses a model developed for North Florida in which your water sheds, when you put water in, perks down into the soil. He doesn't account for our karst landscape here. The fact that we're essentially in very holy, and by mean uh, many holes in limestone, that you easily connect to your surficial aquifer and other aquifers by the lack of confining layers in a lot of the areas here. And as has been mentioned in the very deep mine pits, you have water coming in from the groundwater contributing to your water. Sometimes when people are building their stormwater ponds in dry season, they'll fill up from the groundwater even before there's any contrib contribution to the surface water. And as you put a probe through one of these very deep lakes, you'll see you'll start out with a total suspended solids which says it's fresh water on the top. But as you get down deep below 12 feet and deeper than that, you're getting a high total suspended solids from all of the mineralization that's coming from the groundwater input into these systems. Why do we have the ponds in our landscape? It's not necessarily for stormwater treatment. It was to get fill. That was the way people elevated southwest Florida from being a flat natural landscape that was a series of marine terraces emerged from the Gulf of Mexico. And the way you can get that fill pad is to dig the hole. The way you built the road ridge is to big the, dig the canals, the, the ditches along the road. Remember the classic you know, um, songs from Country Western, keeping it between the ditches. Every one of our roads was built with ditches to get the fill. All of those four rectilinear or, or square ponds around our interchange in, um, in the interstate were to get the fill to build the ramps so that we could take the overpass over the interstate. The, Big things were dug for fill. The large borrow pits are dug for the fill that could spread out over our landscape. Um, it wasn't for stormwater treatment. And it's, they're not deep for stormwater treatment. What you do once you get below about 12 feet here, you start setting yourself up for a turnover. And when the temperatures change, and typically you get to a situation where you'll get a cold front coming through, the lakes will flip, Water with no oxygen in it from the deep pond will come to the surface and you'll get a fish kill. When I used to work for the Game and Fish Commission sections there, we get calls every winter. Fish kill in Sarasota, fish kill in Naples, fish kill in Lee County. From these deep ponds, it flipped. 
And so they also brought the nutrients up from the bottom, the bed load, which had accumulated there. So as has been mentioned, if you don't pull that stuff out on some regular and periodic basis, it'll just continue to sit there, fill, and then eventually it'll get resuspended. So going deep isn't going to be a solution to anyone's problem other than the person that wants cheap fill. Um, finally, you can integrate your stormwater management systems. There are some excellent examples of this in our region and in your own city. At the Bonita Bay development, with the central slough system, with the very small spreader that they have all along the central slough system, they put together a stormwater management system that's worth emulating, where they're able to co collect, treat, put together, discharge the two different stream systems. They do a pretty good job. It was so good it attracted endangered species to come live there after they were done. Um, but you, just because something's new doesn't make it good, so you gotta watch these things. Gateway did a pretty good job, <coughs> and to a large extent, if it had stayed on design, it had a series of cascading systems that eventually went to a filter marsh at the end, which then goes into six mile cypress. You can do that. You can do that in your section of your city, it's in the DRGR, and we might be able to retrofit some of your other systems one thing to think about is regional stormwater management. One of the failures in stormwater management design in Florida is they try to have every little individual project as it comes in be its own box. So you treat everything in the box, you do a little bit of treatment here, a little bit of treatment there, a little bit of treatment there. But if you put our neighborhoods <coughs> or say an urban area that hasn't had stormwater treatments, treatment into a regional system, a filter marsh system like, say, Freedom Park in the Naples area, or you use the floating islands. Naples has a real floating island program going, uh, like Serge was showing, and that's working very well for a number of the ponds in, in, in that area. And you do that sort of thing, and then as a group, many properties contribute to that stormwater treatment system. You can get very effective treatment, which you don't get individually lot by lot by lot. So those are some of my answers. Quick question, what, yeah, for Jim. Uh, Jim, uh, real quick on the Spring Creek, Jim. The uh, the limits that I saw in the scope, of the city said it went east to 75, but you're saying that it does go beyond 75 yeah. as well. And I'm planning to look over there as well. Okay, great. We're, we're going to look at where it went historically, but the actual watershed is defined by the water management district. Gets truncated there today. Okay, good. And then uh, also the uh, the data that you showed on your charts for your water. Uh, chemicals as well as uh, the uh, height. Where, where did, what was the source of that? I don't remember if I saw it. The source comes from the Lee County Water Quality Monitoring along all of those, um, along the tributary. So that's all Keith Kibbe's lab's work and, and so forth. And Jim, a couple meetings ago we were talking about best management practices for uh, dealing with exotics, especially out um, in the crew lands. Mm -hmm. um, Tori had mentioned riding out there and, and seeing how they would uh, ring the trees and spray them, let them die in place, and then eventually fall over. And her, her question was really, why don't they just cut them in, down and remove them? Mm -hmm. Is it when they fall, is it adding to the nutrient loads or anything like that? So I don't know if you want to Well, talking that, about, say, specifically Malaluca, my approach to this is engendered by decades of experience in the Game and Fish Commission and the land managers that I had worked with there, who've done a great job of keeping exotics off of the web wildlife management area. And the approach was that if your exotics are so embedded into a natural landscape that you do more harm than good pulling them out, then you kill in place, let them die in place, if the levels of infestation is relatively low. But when we had a situation on the land where everything was pretty much a monoculture, the approach was scorched earth. Even if it killed some natives in that area, you just took everything out. You, you defined your area, killed the exotics in place, removed them, remove any natives that were killed in that process, get it back to its basic no plants on it condition, and then encourage the natives to come back. And that's, that's how very successfully they keep ex exotics off of the state managed lands. Um, you, you basically have to make a balance between the amount of harm you do relative to the amount of benefits you get back. And once the infestations are very thick, scorched earth is a good approach. And sometimes you want to do it by hauling it out. Sometimes you just want to burn everything 
that you've killed. And you, you accept, and, and, and I think Mike Duver once put it, and he's another restoration ecologist I've worked with over the years, is restoration's not pretty. It, it's gonna look like a mess while you do it, but when it's done and you go back a year later, it looks completely natural if you do that scorched roof approach. Whereas if you just take a little bit at a time, it'll just keep coming back at you over and over again. Um, so for certain things like the climbing ferns, both old world and Japanese climbing fern, um, the, um, some of the soda apples, um, and some of the things like Malaluca in monoculture, or Brazilian pepper in monoculture, scorched earth is a good approach. Does that answer your question? Okay, great, thank you. Anybody else have any questions for these gentlemen? I have one comment, if I could add, <laughs> and uh, for uh, Jim and Wynn and Serge, thank you again for coming today. And uh, you may or may not be aware that part of the process is that this group will be uh, articulating recommendations that go to the city council, and that's part of what we'll be discussing next and in the next couple of meetings. I typically don't lobby for or recommend what recommendations they might consider, but I'm going to break from that tradition. Um, Surge has done some great work with our public works department on uh, educational outreach about pond maintenance and if you would so consider making that one of your recommendations to either enhance or encourage or expand that program. Um, I think personally from what I've dealt with in terms of uh, talking to my public works guys, they, they're really happy with the results they've been getting and the outreach and the, uh, the positive results and the positive feedback they've gotten from people by being out in the community. And Surge has been a part of that and uh, I wanted to thank and them for that and then have you maybe consider that to be one of the policies. I think it's a sure. good point and back to what Tori was saying about can we require and then you answered too I think uh, require higher standards. I think the answer is yes and in fact we said in our in some of our parking lot items that we would want to have low impact developments standards that would apply to any development there and whereas the program that John mentioned on the uh, cooperation with the HOAs maybe it's voluntary now but we can make that mm -hmm. mandatory that doesn't have to be voluntary for it for for new standards so and, and sir is there is there a portion of that that's monitoring as well I mean just best man or you know education and best management practices are one thing but to go into a let's say a community where they've got six interconnected ponds and you actually do water testing they implement some policies and you go back and test again and and show them the improvement I think that goes a long way yeah, it, it, it does happen sometimes that, well, first you need to have a lake committee, and um, I don't say that very often, but when they do have a lake committee and they actually, for example, I'm working for East Carlton Lakes right now, North Naples, and they have uh, 16 lakes which are interconnected, so I study all of them, and they, they, they really want to, well, there is an educational part also. I come there quite often and show them the results, and people are really involved. They also make phone calls to the district. I mean, it's really, that's... That really makes me very, very happy when I see this. And they, they also start to have, you know, um, rain garden. I'm not sure. We haven't talked about rain gardens, but basically it's like integrating wetlands within the urban areas. That's something that should be done as well. I mean, it's, it's really incredible. And how are you getting these, you know, Carlton Lakes, how are you getting them involved in the program? Is there, is there a financial incentive? They just incentive contacted they me just through, uh, you know, after this, this, this some had a meeting, and they contacted me and said, we have a problem with the lakes. Uh, you know, we have bad erosion problem. We have, we use too much copper. The student, the, the homeowner are, are complaining. Um, can you come over? And and they all finance the whole thing. I mean, it's it's really incredible. Great. It's it's totally uh, funded, self-funded communities. Great. Please. Just uh, one follow-up, and I uh, assume there's a variety of opinions on the task force about how relevant the discussion of FGCU and how it was designed and developed uh, could be to what we're doing. But I, I think it's very relevant because I, I believe that if we're looking at potential new development standards, having something that doesn't lower the groundwater table and actually helps to bring it back up, that that is exactly what we're about here. So I, I think that that's a very relevant discussion and we'll probably have some follow-up questions for someone uh, knowledgeable on that as to exactly how that worked and how it, it could be applicable here but I, I think that is an important point 
Right. I, th I think too that it's it's for someone who is as uh, new to this as I am, and to to envision a lot of this in a concrete, you know, me, I'm always a feasible, <laughs> actual practical thing that I could see actually asking people to do, or to be able to see some of these ideas put into play and say, okay, well that that there's something that we could take to the city council and say, if you want to see it being done. And I think that takes some of the fear. The word that I hear from the city council all the time is, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake. I'm afraid I'm going to vote wrong. You know, and it's like, well, some of the fear can be taken out if there's not just a paper and a graph. If you can actually walk around and say, okay, these are things that, that, that somebody else has done and have worked and it's in our area. I mean, it couldn't be more in our area. No, and I agree. I mean, I think when you can, when we say implement a low impact development standard, here's an example. That's fine. I, I'm, what my point was when we're starting to get into specifics about their their lake quality right. water, that that sort of stuff is. But I think it was also interesting. The thing, one thing that always brings me back to being slightly disturbed by all the environmental scientists that I speak to, is that ultimately, um, and I appreciate when you're saying that we're going to make mistakes, is that it's always changing this. Any, no matter what we decide here might be a good idea. It might come along that, boy, that sounded like a good idea at the time, but now maybe we're going to have to step it back. And so to just have this paralysis by analysis that we don't allow anything to happen or anything to go on, of course, is my biggest fear because we, we have to study it another five years because we're not quite sure if, I'm sure that no matter when we spoke to um, any of the professors at the university, they'd always have a study going on. So there's a, also a tendency among some of the members and some of the people that talk to us to wait until we get more data, wait till we get more studies, wait, 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 wait. And um, I, I'm totally against that myself too. So I, I, I'm trying to look for, for ideas that are actually working. That's all my. And I do think it was also interesting to note that with FGCU, it wasn't this smooth sailing, we want to do the right thing, so here we are on our path of doing the right thing. And I think it's important, Jim's point, that it was a DRI, a development of regional impact, and we aren't going to have really that luxury anymore because DRIs are being uh, you know, phased out. So if it's going to be the city's responsibility. If something like this is put in place, these high standards, the, the buck's going to stop with the city, and the city is going to have to be tough enough to ensure that the standards that are put forward are met as any new development is, is being proposed. So I think it, it's a cautionary note that the best of ideas can get really knocked down a few notches through the process. <coughs> so uh, I have to get the high standards and, and make sure that we have the foresight to enforce them. It's an opportunity. Scott, I'd like to add Please to what it. Nicole said the um, first of all the owner of that land ultimately was the government and even the government had trouble trying to balance out lots of buildings versus the right fortunately the the right prevailed now the drgr is not owned by the government and if you take and say we can increase the density and we're going to Right away, you're going to have proposals in here, and you're stuck with the current standards. So we must be prepared to make recommendations on, in, like, increasing the amount of retention that's required if you develop above and beyond what South Florida Water Management requires, what the city requires. In fact, I could even be persuaded to say the whole city should have more water retention required than it does now, but for sure the DRGR. If you do that, you're going to help recharge. You're going to reduce flooding. You're going to also be, the water is going to be on the property longer. You're going to reduce the pollution load going into the rivers and the streams and all out in the Gulf. I think those are the bites I think that we've got to address pretty shortly. I imagine we're going to have some frank differences of opinion, but I personally think we have to do this. I think we have to pursue every resource on getting funding to buy land out there. And you've got a congressman that supports it. 
There, there are sources of revenue, so we, we can't just say that's a pipe dream. We got to pursue it. But At I least think we can recommend. I think it. one of the things we're talking about here, though, is even whether we decide that, that to make a recommendation for purchasing more. Th this is kind of bringing me into a topic that's just kind of making me a little nuts this week. The water table in East Bonita has risen quite substantially lately um, along Terry Street and Bonita Grand, and Pine Lake Preserve is dry. I mean, it is unbelievable to me that, I mean, to me that's like one of our first priorities, that that is an isolated dry island out there right now when everything else, the weir is high, the east side of the road, all around it. So I would like to, to focus on um, working with some of the land that we already own within the city and is already um, government owned or water management owned or whatever to rehydrate those areas first. I think it's going to come down to motions will be made and they'll either pass or fail. I don't expect that there will be a unanimous decision on <laughs> a lot of things. I don't see that that's bad. It doesn't mean that uh, anyone that has one view versus the other is a bad person. Nobody's being personally attacked. It's just a matter of, I, I want to see us get the water right. And it's all over the newspapers and the media. Water is a hot topic, not only in Florida, but all over the United States. So we need to make sure that what we do is right. And we will make some mistakes, as was said. But I would rather err on the side of caution than go and make a decision that says, let it rip. Any other discussion of what the gentleman today presented? I think they did a great job. Yeah, I like yeah. liked everything. So thank you very much. Great thank job. Thank you. Um, have we invited them to the, no, the, the group love-in, so to speak? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was going to get to that a little later in the agenda, the plans for the 29th and who would be good invitees and what the game plan is. So. Yeah. Well, I'd say make, we, we make sure they know about it. We can get to that now if you want. But Will there be beer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd be happy to. Am I allowed to buy him a beer afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to buy you a beer. Yeah, we should get Serge momentum. owes him a beer. <laughs> we should get momentum to cater it, the new. If Audrey allows me to, I'll buy you a beer after the meeting. How's that? Um, all right, do we want to do want to skip the parking lot then? Let's move. We can move down we, the list and sure. come back to the parking lot if we've got Absolutely. time. Um, Mr. Chairman, please. I, I would like to touch base with the parking lot for about five minutes if we could, please. Okay. Uh, basically, I guess, as you know, I spent a considerable amount of time developing a vast plethora of, of recommendations <laughs> and of understanding the comments that came back. And I want to say the, the reason why I changed or edited and changed recommendations was to adhere to our basic mission statement. And I think we need to go back to ground zero and remember what we agreed to. Just, hand, hand, just, take a, no, just take one copy, please. Basically, we have here is back to January and February and what everybody said. Basically, a, a proposal was made to adopt our mission statement that identified the objectives for the implementing ordinance. Fred seconded to the, sec, I'm sorry, Here's the next, next one for you. Oh. <laughs> and so we, back in February, you, you, you unanimously agreed to a mission statement based on implementing the objectives that were there in the ordinance. And I think I found this very helpful in going through the, the things. I can sort of take some of the emotional out of it and say, this doesn't match up with our mission statement or what this does. Thank you. Okay. Right. And I guess uh, I'll just follow along on on that because I I do agree with David. I mean, really, we are here to look at these water related issues, and I think that uh, you know that it doesn't necessarily mean that we won't be broaching the subject of understanding that to to get to implement an overall Bonita DRGR vision there's going to have to be local regulations, intergovernmental coordination, and probably some incentive-based component. 
but I think that those have to follow once we have that vision put together of how we really address all of those water-related issues. And so in, in my mind, uh, I, I think that we should be looking at those water-related solutions, issues, visions, whatever you want to call them, and it's going to be council's decision of how they want to move that forward. Uh, but if we can get those those water visions and, and water recommendations put forward first, then we look at, at those other issues. So I, I do agree. I think we should really focus on, on the water topics. Okay. All right, so noted. Um, so let's jump ahead to uh, member items and reports. I know Dennis has a uh, well, presentation. Well, I mean, what I had, uh, and if, you know, if, if this is something you want to say for later, we can do it. Uh, what I, since in the parking lot, I had suggested different things that were opportunities, as we talked about, for private funding and, and for funding of things that we put on our shopping list, our, our parking lot list. Um, uh, I thought I would clarify, with, and I have just a real simple slideshow to do that, but it can wait. I mean, if you'd say, well, you know, this is not our job, I mean, that's fine, but um, I don't think some of the things I know David had crossed through saying, well, that's not our job. Well, I, do, I want to at least clarify how, how I got to those numbers if, if, if you're interested. I'm interested because yeah, I, I, I really, I, I don't see the delineation. I, maybe I'm missing the point here, but... I don't see separating any idea of density out of any portion of this because it was interesting to me that even when you talk about infill, everyone's always, well, we want to do infill in the city. We want to bring more development into the areas that are already developed. And then there was this, this uh, number of 59% uh, or 52 percent urbanized in the Spring Creek watershed. It's it's become so filled, and that's impacted the Spring Creek watershed. So whether, as a city, we're deciding to allow urbanization, a higher level of urbanization in the Spring Creek watershed, or some increased density within the um, Imperial watershed, these are people are coming and moving, and areas are being developed within the city and it's impacting our waterways in general. So if we just don't even look at increased or possible increase or possibly not increasing any density, changes the whole um, conversation of what we have about stormwater management and stormwater quality or, or water quality. So I, I don't think that we can say, okay, well, no mention of density and that's the feeling that I'm getting from um, certain members and that's why I was saying it is it is within all of these, we were put together because there were people who came forward with proposals that wanted to increase density. And they're like, let's get the water right first. Okay, let's get the water right, and then we can decide as to the density levels, but we can't just work in a vacuum. So I'm very interested in what you have to say. Yeah, I, I think too that, um, you know, as we've gone through this process, we may have recommendations that relate to citywide efforts, not just DRGR. So, um, you know, to the extent we say any new density increase, we require this standard, I think that would be more than appropriate, whether it's within the DRGR or outside of the DRGR. So I think when we talk about, I was a little turned off, and I think I even deleted the one that said implement the Barocco report with 5,000 units in the DRGR, something to that effect. I, I, I don't think that's our job. I, I tend to agree with you that from a density standpoint, it's not our job to determine how much density is going to be put in the DRGR. However, that being said, I think it is our job to say, here's what we recommend. Here's how, here's an opportunity of how to pay for it, whether it be a per unit fee within, within an overlay district or something to that effect. I think that is within our job, uh, within, within our task. So, Well, y yes and no. I, I don't want us to get into an argument about how much something's going to cost up for the, the council to make a decision whether it's worth the value or not 
Well, I don't think we can even estimate the real cost of something because by the time it gets to, I think we just have to have a general view of whether something's feasible. Yeah. And I know that you brought forward this figure of, of almost $3 million, which is, thank you for doing that work and, and for going and um, researching that. But uh, a lot of these things are going to cost more than $3 million. I mean, I'm trying to be polite, but it's still, we've got to find a lot of funding from, the city has to find a lot of funding. Well, my, my, my objective was trying to, when we start going through this, necking down, let's get that to a manageable few that we really, really support 100% and get there. And part of the process was looking at mission statements and throwing it away or, or bringing it in is to help necking it down. It doesn't mean things we don't take, we don't include are bad, it's just we need a process to neck it, neck it down. Right, well, and I, I, I'm sorry, because I, I recognize that starting the discussion of the parking lot items was gonna get us going into a rabbit's hole, so I tried to avoid <laughs> it. Um, for a reason, so let's, if we can, let's just table this for now. I'd like to hear Dennis's proposal, and then we'll, we'll if we have time, we'll come back to it. Right. And, and my only point was, I didn't think that we had gotten to the getting the water right to the point where I was comfortable talking about density, but I think that any task force member that has information to bring forward, yes, absolutely, we want to hear what you have. So I wasn't trying to say that it wasn't appropriate to hear your information. Okay. John, uh, is the slide projector workable now? Or I could just pass that out and we could talk through it either John, way. John, we can crank it's it working. over again. I didn't know you needed it. Uh, <laughs> i tell you what, why don't you pass those out? Because I think in the, in the, for time, and then if there's, uh, well, there's, there's two things that I just, I'll just share with the group here, and you can, I'll walk through the, there's a slideshow, but it, coming up. I think, oh, okay. Um, I can walk through it on the slides then in that case. But there's two things. The, the, uh, the first one is the, just some of the economic elements that... Do you have a microphone? Yeah, he's, he's going up there. Um, there was uh, two things that I just wanted to point out to the group. One of them was just going through the economics that I had recommended in the parking lot list so that you understand the basis of it. And the second one, there's been quite a bit of discussion on population and a lot of misinformation on it and I wanted to clarify a couple things for you on that as well for the build out of Bonita Springs which is really really what we're talking about what regardless of the density if it's zero or 5,000 or anything else what we're talking about is what is the build out so this this one here real quick and you've got your your hand out with you you know the limits I'm not going to bore you with the things you already know we'll go through it quickly we know the purpose of it uh, for water is issues, low density. There are some uses that are allowed in the, in the DRGR, nonprofit recreational things that are there now, uh, out there now. We've, we do have some differences from some other parts of the lead DRGR that I've pointed out before that it includes things like our water facilities and operations and YMCA and soccer fields and headquarters for our fire department. So there's things already that are totally different than what we see in parts of, of uh, other Lee County parts of the DRGR, not to take away from the environmental integrity that we want to maintain and enhance out there, but we do have some things that no other part of the Lee County DRGR has, and that's 2,000 homes, and uh, most of our vacant land is, is farm field. It's not what you saw at FGCU, it's, which was natural lands. We have basically disturbed, ditched, pumped farm fields, 2,000 acres. Efficiencies of services, of course, that would be an issue for the city council to say, you know, why why would we want to look at economics, or why would we, why would the, as an elected body, uh, this is not something that can't be served efficiently by existing services. We don't need another city manager. We don't need another John Gucciardo uh, or Andre. So. And of course, the benefits then would get in, into the, the the function and the role of the task force is. How do we come up with solutions and then funding mechanisms? It won't be the total funding any more than, than other sources, but it is another opportunity for funding sources and environmental solutions with funding, uh, as well as designing standards that we've talked about for, for new, new development. And here's the economics, the, the punchline I'm getting to real quick, and I'll, I'll keep it as brief as I can. The tax base now from that area, which is about 25%, of the surface area of the city is about one to one and a half percent of the tax base for the city. Um, 
the potential, of course, is new funding sources for infrastructure, including roads and drainage and, and water uh, uh, projects, environmental projects, as well as the, the jobs and the creation and the tax base. But this is an interesting thing. I think just a good perspective to keep in mind. Bonita Springs has an 84 percent higher tax base than the city of Fort Myers. I mean, that's, that's mind-boggling when you think about it. You think Fort Myers is bigger and all that and has all the commercial industrial. Our tax base is higher, which allows us to have a 64 percent lower millage rate. That includes the fire in the city because uh, Fort, uh, Fort Myers has its fire and city together. It allows us to have a total millage that's 26 percent lower. And how we got that is because we have a solid tax base of well-planned communities, high-end communities. We have the beach property. We have places like all of us live in now that, that uh, are, provide a, a very good tax base, which means we, we have a low tax rate in the city of Bonita Springs. There's the taxes that a typical Bonita Springs resident pays, 16.2 mils. You can see the city of Bonita Springs and the fire department in red. 5%, only, the city millage for what a taxpayer in Bonita pays is only 5% of the total tax hit of the ad valorem. There's our land area of the DRGR, 5,300 acres at the top. Percentage of the city area is 21.5%. This was a, something I broke down a few years back uh, of the uh, percentage of the tax base at 1.5%. This was what was recommended by the Barocca report. Of all the things that was in that report that we can be criti critical of, the best thing he came up with was, was, in my view, and I had nothing to do with it, uh, was, was some additional funding sources that could go toward environmental and lands programs. And that's the millage that he would add on, he proposed. And no action, of course, been done. And that's how the breakdown of that would go. Uh, if we had that additional, and I'm just using 5,000 units because that was his number, but it's not really his number either. It's, it's just a number I pick because it's an easy number because I think he had 6,300. But just at 300,000 a unit, real simple, gives you $25 million per year in additional taxes from that area, from current. The add-on, if we did that add-on millage rate, it gives the city an additional $2 million a year in taxes. The 5.5 million is the ad valorem revenues from this tax fiscal year. It's 37% higher. So we've got, right now, we've got 21% of the land area. We could have 37% more taxes, and the population is really, really about a 10, 9 to 10% increase, if even if you use 5,000, which might be a big number. So it's it's not. Um, well, I'll get into that in just a minute too. This is the impact fees that a typical builder pays today a single family home builder would pay in Bonita Springs. This was also an add-on impact fee that was recommended. Um, those categories, I'll show you in just a minute, what I had recommended in your parking lot list, a little different breakdown of the $5,000. Uh, 5,000 units would provide uh, $25 million of additional impact fees. You can see that's what it would look like just for those um, 5,000 units, it's actually $127 million of total impact fees, but 25 um, of the add-on itself. Jobs, service jobs, as well as new construction jobs. So what I had suggested w in your parking lot that I gave you was um, breaking that $25 million down a little differently so you got flowway projects, environmental funding, and water quality projects, really all of it going to water and environmental projects. And then the tax base, all of that going to either to the city for new codes and new requirements and, and funding of studies and monitoring or to uh, fund annual programs that would allow for things such as land purchases as well as uh, water quality projects. So $2 million additional per year and then $25 million in impact fees. Uh, again, that, that's the tax base increase of 37% and provide for environmental funding as well as things like Spring Creek and water qualities. And yeah, there'll be other funding sources and, and hopefully there will be both federal, state, and local monies for those other projects. But this just provides another opportunity for enhancing the tax base and, uh, and, and growing our, our project list that we can do with, uh, for environmental and water projects. So that's really it. And then uh, John will hand out uh, another little paper. I'm not going to talk about much on the population. And you'll see what I've done. Can you hand that up, John? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I can. Here, and I'll, I'm going to just sit back down. Thank you. 
<coughs> Dennis, thanks. It, um, yep. Comparatively speaking, what um, impact fees would people pay in other municipalities well, around the uh, area? Collier, Collier's, uh, it would compare, Collier's a little higher, so actually market-wise, this area compares more to Collier County, which pays a higher impact fee. So we can probably pay a little bit more market-wise and get away with it. And so that's why I'm saying that the additional 5,000 doesn't really hurt us because we're, we're still competing with the Collier impact fees, which are higher. And Collier didn't reduce theirs like Lee did by 80%. They in, they'd reduced theirs by like 20%. So they're still up there pretty high. Um, but what I just passed out on the population, and there's um, uh, what, what I did was just say, look at the build out for Bonita Springs population, and it's probably somewhere even with the high peak season, without the DRGR, it's probably in the 105, 110,000 unit of people range. It's going to be over 100,000 whether we like it or not, whether Bonita happens or not, because we have enough vacant land to develop without the DRGR to get to that number. With, with the DRGR, take into account that you have the seasonal population as well as you have a market selection, which you always have 5 or 6% unoccupied units. Uh, in, in, throughout the, the, the market. It's about an additional 10,000 people. So we're really talking, in my estimate on that chart on the red, is about 9% increase in the total build-out population by the DRGR. And that would be just based on an assumed, I'm not recommending, just an assumed 5,000 units just for talking. So real simply, 20, it's 21, per, uh, the, the tax base is 1.5%, it goes to 37%. Land area is 21.5%, and the population increase is 9%. So it's a, if, if that were the numbers, that's a good bang for the buck, in my view, to say, okay, you've got efficiencies of services, and as I've mentioned in here, you're within two miles of the urban core of the city, the downtown Fort uh, Bonita Springs of, of, uh, of the urban core area. So I think it's just a, something to keep on your mindset, and we're not. It has, it has very little to do with the water recommendations other than just saying, okay, there's at some point you get into funding and, and that's, that's why I just want to bring that up so that when you see my numbers in there, you kind of see where it came from and, and, uh, and that perspective. But we As could, a private person that's been in development for 30 years, that's, that's where my but, background but is. But we could take those fees then and, and, and rec we could, as a task force, recommend to the city to allocate those funds towards water projects? That's what that's, I would recommend. That's what yes. you're recommending? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just say it gives an, an additional source of monies to to provide for some of the things that are on our wish list, which is on our shopping list, really, uh, or our, our parking lot list. Um, that, uh, yeah, we can't estimate all the costs, uh, but we certainly can say there, there would be additional over and above the tax base, over and above impact fees. Both of those elements are what I think can be done and can be done and still not hurt the market, if you will. To, or to have say. to increase taxes on the rest of the city. Oh, no, right. Yeah, right. it would keep the taxes down for the Otherwise, you know, I know, I know there's been some discussion about saying, well, let's put a millage over every, everybody to do lands and all. That can be done, too. But this, this could be its own deal. I have copies here, John, if you. if you want to leave any out for, I know this. Some of the public might want some. Oh, okay. Yeah, Dennis, thanks for doing that. Thanks That's, for doing uh, that work. I, I, if it, if it's off track a little bit, if we're, I'm, I'm, I apologize, but I just think that perspective, uh, just as the density, it might be two units an acre or three or four, I, I don't really know, but whatever that is is for somebody else some other day. But, but I know that we do have an opportunity for additional revenue sources and uh, this will be in the this will be on the w uh, website as well. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank, sorry. Thank you. No, that's okay. Any questions for Dennis? Well, I, I don't know if it's. Qu I'd like to make sure the group understands that with development impact fee, you get it when it's built and sold for the most part. So, if you if we would go ahead and say, go ahead and increase the density city council, and they do it, and you don't have all these new regulations in place, then you would have a lot of development done under the existing regulations, oh, including uh, the way they build pads and all that, which FGCU didn't do. 
So that's why I say I, I believe that we're not in a position to move forward. I'm not against moving forward, but I want to make sure that we have all the checks and balances in place that when we do move forward, that we are getting a good development out there, we're getting the more water retention, and we're getting these impact fees, which I think Dennis did a great job with what he did. Fred, I agree, I agree with you. I don't, yeah. I don't think it, we need to allow things to happen before these are done. However, whoever does anything has got to do a comprehensive plan amendment, and that takes a while. And these, right. these can be integrated. Oh, yeah. It's just as, like the low impact development right. standards. Yeah. Anyone else? All right, we'll move on to uh, staff updates. The submittal by Kevin Irwin relative to the water monitoring plan. <laughs> Yeah, and I, again, I don't know how much you want to get into that today, but uh, that's Kevin's response to his presentation from last time and his recommendation that he put together a plan for monitoring as we go forward. Um, I haven't had a chance to do a lot with it. Frankly, what I was hoping to be able to do, and I'm still going to try to do, is to contact other agencies that are out there doing something similar along with my public works people to see what might already be out there in place that is close to this so we can work around that because frankly i was a little surprised that that the cost estimates involved sticker shock in, yeah a little bit of sticker <laughs> shock but that's just me i'm i don't uh, do that stuff that was so, me too you know um so anyway uh, that's what i was planning on doing i'll try to have that for our next meeting and also I, I think that there are landowners out here probably the mine has some monitoring mm -hmm. well so checking with the landowners to see I have a whole list of people that yeah, I wanted so, to get in so touch to see with what's there yeah. not just right. on public lands but on private lands and and trying to get that information gotcha. I was not at the meeting I, I was able to listen to the meeting and I think Dennis it was you that brought up a point that I've been quite concerned with and that is that um, I, I know I'm not going to describe this right okay you've got a certain elevation of the land and you're going to try to measure the water going through. And because of um, how much time I spend out there, I know that if I ride my horse on the side of the where the, all the four-wheelers have been, there's this, uh, I mean, I'm up to my elbows if I ride in the four-wheel track, and I'm barely covering a hoof if I'm on the edge. So when I first looked at this idea of the monitoring, I thought without actually truly knowing the altitude of the land that that the gauge was on and then I, how accurate is the gauge if it's to the south side of my dike or to the north side of my dike because there's already so many alterations within the land that one year's data f from land that's already been so altered without having specific scientific knowledge of this dipstick might show it's only running three inches in this area and that one's in six but this one might be a lower piece or that one might have a ditch in mm -hmm. front of it and the whole thing just seemed so arbitrary to me that i couldn't see it as being scientifically valid and i i really would like someone to come in here and talk to us because it doesn't seem expensive enough to me to be that accurate it just seems like popping a few things around without any rhyme or reason and, th and that's just from Nicole. me looking at it my understanding of that and and we should have someone with the expertise to clarify but my understanding is i what you're trying to do is get those subsurface groundwater levels to be back closer to the historical level so that you can decrease the problems of flooding and and pollution and all of that and so by putting the wells in you're looking at through a wet and dry season, how much that groundwater fluctuates. And then that is compared to historical levels, which are determined by people much more technical than I am, so that you can then try to plan because you know, and I think that it will show if there's a dike or a levee on one side, those groundwater levels are going to be very different than on the other side. And so then you can start to, I believe, plan for what needs to happen on certain parts. Right, but, the, but it's, it's, it's a dike every five acres. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an alteration. That's what I think Dennis was talking mm. about. This isn't like the Lee County DRG or that's undisturbed. That, that land is so disturbed in so many 
complicated ways that have absolutely not necessarily a rhyme or reason because it's all been done by guys in their backhoes that were just arbitrarily digging around their land. So it's, it's not that clear. I had uh, listed two on an email to John that's in your packet. Uh, there's, I count nine different sources of water monitoring that are currently done. And it seems to me that it'd be best to say some of those might be useful, some might not, some of them might be accurate or as John West mentioned, maybe something's caved in and, and not useful at all. But uh, it seems like that should be organized in a way that's useful and then say, what do we need? And, and my concern, there's still uh, approximately 50 or so different stations here. It just seems like an awful lot of monitoring, and they happen to all be in areas that he was recommending for, for restoration versus flow patterns and flow ways. And I, I agree with what Nicole's saying about looking at water levels and um, uh, some of them are inside the berm here, some are outside, okay. But we don't even have any monitoring for the pumping that's going on from Citrus Park. I mean, and it's pumping now. I mean, so I, I just think it needs, needs to, well, what, what are we doing it and why are we doing it? And then what's already out there? I, I don't think those have been addressed yet. And to address your concern about accuracy, he does have a line item for surveyors to go out and level the gauges so that they're all set to the same level. The other thing I'd mentioned to Wynn Everham a few days back is that uh, maybe the FGCU students can help, re re you know, do some of the monitoring and, and the data collection and, uh, and save us some costs there, too. And then these well marks, are they existing wells or, or wells he'd like to, those little blue dots? I think, I think, new. I think he's proposing all new. those. Yeah, they would be. Mm hmm yeah, that's where he's proposing. Does he to put. ask me if he can put one on my land? <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of privately. Owned. We're taking your land. Yeah, right. <laughs> just <a> joking. Well. <laughs> um, all right. So, no decisions being made on that. I, I'd like to hear as to what monitoring is out there. I I tend to agree that there's. I'm sure there's plenty, plenty of stuff. Yeah. Can, can so. I make a comment? <laughs> <clears throat> I think that the amount of money that he was talking about was minuscule, number one, and it, and it was, I know those of us that were here, I, my impression was we felt we would not have a problem getting sufficient volunteers to do the readings. And he did say what uh, Scott said about uh, getting actual topographical readings at the spots and all that. And if, if you don't get more data then you're saying we've got enough data and uh, but i agree with what dennis is saying i think the other the other part of the deal is we need to better organize the, the <coughs> data collection that's going on right now as we speak so but i i do think that we need i personally think that it's value in supporting it and it doesn't cost that much money especially if we went with the, the volunteers which i know i'd be willing to go do it um, Sure, at least one or two others sitting at this table would probably do it, and probably some in the audience. So, do you think, John, that by the next meeting you'd be able to kind of have a, a list of what wells are out there? Um, Going to try. And, yeah. Okay. And has Public Works chimed in on this at all yet? Not yet. No. Okay. Okay. Next meeting date. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the meeting on the 29th. That's the one that we decided, you decided, would be at the fire station out on Bonita Grand. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about logistics and how that could work. Um, we're going to have our BTV consultant, because he also does some of the TV consulting work for the fire district. I'll be meeting out with him out there beforehand to make sure we get camera coverage Again, it won't be broadcast live, but it will be taped and then rebroadcast on BTV. But my understanding from the way it was described earlier was that you're envisioning kind of a workshop, a tabletop exercise workshop with maps. So minutes so. might yeah. be kind of an issue. Um, it may be that we tape. I'll bring a digital tape recorder so that we can have a separate, you know, backup um, mechanism for for taping but you may get very minimal minutes in, in the sense that it might just be 
the beginning of the meeting, the minutes, and then going into the workshop and not tape the actual workshop because obviously if there are different people at different tables, that's not going to work. Right. Um, and then maybe a summary would go back on on the record at the end if that's okay. Does that sound about what you're Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Karen does a great job with our minutes. They're probably, in my mind, too extensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, I mean, she's almost giving us verbatim minutes, which she doesn't really need to do. I think she does a tremendous job with them, but uh, I'm, I'm fine having a little less... And, and typically when council does workshops as opposed to their normal meetings or hearings, we don't try to get a record of what's discussed at each table. Right. Um, they, again, there may be some summary later on, if, if, but that's up to the group. And, and I would maybe we, what we could do is have each table have some sort of um, pad of paper or something where people are jotting down their thoughts and that becomes the record. Um, as opposed to, you know, because you're not going to capture everybody's comments, whereas if they write their their suggestions. So this is generally a meeting to facilitate all of us hands on the map and being able to talk to each other <laughs> finally for the first <laughs> yeah, time. I mean, this is something Nicole started and, and, and put together right. that we're expanding and Nicole, on. why don't you kind of give us an idea of how you yeah, think it could work? Uh, several meetings ago, I had indicated that just in, in looking at trying to find a an overall landscape level map of what needs to happen generally in the DRGR to get the water right. I had asked a, a series of experts and, and folks to sit down with the large map and start drawing things out and just looking at overall, this is what needs to be done with the water. And I, when I mentioned this at the meeting, it was suggested that I speak with some of the landowners out there, which I have done, met with uh, BSU and with the mine, um, with the folks that have the contract for the BSU surplus lands, not Dennis, but uh, <laughs> others. And uh, also sat down with Kevin Irwin and a number of other folks and just said, what could make sense out here? And we've gone through a number of iterations. Uh, no one has tarred and feathered me yet, so I assume that they're not completely displeased. I don't know if something like this vision map is going to be helpful. I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. But from my perspective, I needed something like this to make all of the different policy recommendations really make sense. For example, one of them was four to 500 additional acres for storage. That's arbitrary depending on how large the area is, if it's a bunch of little areas, where it's located. I, we have to, in my mind, have a, a bit more vision of how we get to where we want to go. So anyway, uh, I've put together just a map for consideration and a text explanation, I guess, of the different elements of the map, which I will be sharing for the next agenda packet and the committee the task force can take a look and uh, do what you'd like with that. Let me, were you envisioning um, get, getting me something that I can have blown up for sure. tabletop, table size, and I'll make a bunch of them type things? If so, I may need the map yeah, you know, well in advance so yep. I can have those made uh, up. Yes, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Well, if we can get it out to us sooner, too, that would be helpful. And we may, need, may want more than one type of map if that makes sense more than one focus so we may want to, I, I well, think a whole map well, I don't know of what, the I, drgr just an aerial map oh perfect also if that's all it is great. well that it's it's an aerial with uh you know certain things marked in on it but it might also be good to have just the plain drgr aerial yeah map because too. once you get once you get a lot of lines on it and a lot of people marking and things and it it's a little harder to have one plain one is also i think really valuable so why don't you send me the one whatever you started off from this way I'm looking at the same maps okay Nicole are you envisioning that this would be all of us in one group with one map or are you looking at breakout sessions with different topics I I don't know that that's up to the task force and staff about how the workshop itself is run I honestly had planned to give this to the task force earlier than this but some of the landowners had requested that I not until they had given their feedback to see if, if there were some areas of, of mutual agreement. So, you know, I, I don't know how we want to run the workshop per se. I would think that it would be great if 
we as the task force and anyone else that's interested could all sit around a big table and, and talk through some of these things. I mean, I guess we could do it where there were different tables with a task force member at each table interacting with the community. That's another way to do it. But I really think that we as a task force do need some time to sit around a table and a map and, and really be able to interact because we haven't. I agree because the 951 um, road project always did the multiple maps with multiple tables. And I, I found it disjointed. And especially because we're the ones really, I, I, I think the sunshine rules. I see the point, but they're very frustrating. So I'm looking forward to being able to have open conversations with each other. If I can throw my two cents in there, what I would like to see is it either individual or large maps, and thereby, anytime we mention something in the parking lot, Keel Canal, have a dot, a marker, or something that shows where it is and the influence we're talking about. Or, so there's relationship between the, the map and what we're discussing. Okay, let, let me ask a, a question. It's kind of relates to what we're talking about, but it may not. The recommendation, which is like a out of the air, 500 acres more water storage, is that, does that include potential probable retention, detention ponds that'll be built if that place is developed? Or is that 500 acres of pretty much like a wetland? I think that's up to the city to decide. I mean, really, if the, if, if, as Serge was saying, that the wetland idea is better than the retention pond idea, and we decide that that's a recommendation, then the city has to decide whether to allow private pub public partnership to do it or whether they want to do that. Well, if we right, but Fred, that's a parking lot item that we're, we've tabled because right. we're trying to get through a couple of things. We're trying to figure out at our next meeting how we're going to structure putting these big maps on the table and how to discuss them. So, And what I'm gathering is I'm envisioning one large table, maybe it means putting a bunch of smaller tables together with a couple of versions of large maps. Some of the large maps will be just the original template of the DRGR. Some of the maps will be the, the latest iteration of whatever you guys have been working on. And all of the members, plus wh whoever from the public, plus whatever experts, consultants want to show up, would be working around that one table so you're all hearing the same thing. We will bring I'm guessing lots of sticky notes yes. <laughs> so that you can kind of, as consensus maybe develops, you can start placing some things out there so we can see what the things look like and we'll take it from there. That'd be great. And if you can bring your maps because they're fantastic. Yeah, I, I should point out too that task force members that haven't looked at, on that top aerial, I, I highlighted in pink the Southern Crew Project and, and we can talk about that later next, next okay. time. But Take a look at that as far as if you haven't kind of gotten your bearings of where that Southern Crew Project is, you can see it on, on that map now. Okay. And you know, nothing that we've been doing with this vision mapping is secret. I've been copying John on everything, so it, it's, it's part of the record. I can attest to that. <laughs> o almost <laughs> hourly. <laughs> you just can't wait. Uh, he, he does have that information, so I just I, I want to make clear we weren't trying to do this in a vacuum and then spring it on you. Everything is in the file. I almost sent you back. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> the, the but you update once a week. Sort of what you're thinking about? You know, map of the area and then indicated. I'm going to try to get it much bigger than that, frankly. Yeah, but yeah. well, but it's got all the little the yellow things which are it's places that have been named in the in the recommendations. This, yeah, I, this is generally what it is. But I'm looking for a, a logo that. Dennis put on there so you know what all the, the numbers and dots are. Of that if you like to pass them out. But I found this to be very useful. Yeah, so that might be so another yeah, one. And maybe we have a few maps that we need to have blown up, but I, I don't want to inundate us with 74 so maps of. And right. Way you've right. And, that and please, if you are going to send additional maps, please give me enough time to re have them reproduced and, and ready for the Sometimes meeting. So. I've got the, the also drainage, what I passed drainage. out to everybody earlier was the large map with the drainage basin divides on it that were part of the water management study, and I think that's kind of important as well. Nicole, one final question. Yes. Um, in terms of invitees, should I leave that up to you at this point to get me a list of people? Because I know you've been dealing with some of the property owners and consultants and things like that, and I, I, I'll do it any way you want, but I don't want to miss anybody that but you have already kind of reached out to. So. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll let you know. I think most of the people are already aware know about of, it. And, okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. And yeah, and I think anybody who's presented to us should have should be invited. Anybody who's ever 
yes. done a presentation to us should gotcha. should have an opportunity to be be there. Formal presentation. <laughs> Will there be snacks? No. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. So that's the 29th, and we've got October 13th and October 27th. And I'm still assuming that the 13th and 27th will then refocus on the parking lot issues. Uh, just a, a little side, I know we don't want to get into the parking lot item itself, but format-wise, are you okay with what we did, separating each one out individually with everybody's comments about that particular one? A lot yeah, of it's duplication. Well, but, but I did notice some some of the people didn't redline their changes, so it was a little bit hard to track. I, I so, had to give well, it to you the way I got I, it. No, I know. So, <laughs> so I'm just, just reminding everybody, when you make changes to the proposed parking lot items, please redline or track your changes. If you don't know how to do that. I can't do it on my program. I don't have a word. So mine, I can't, I can't alter the document. Are you an Apple person? I am. Oh boy. Computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are ways to track changes. I mean, I don't know how you do that. I mean, I'd be happy to do it, but I can't do it. So right. <laughs> I don't know if there's somebody at staff that could, that could you just hit compare it's, it's quite easy if, but if you don't get it worked out let me know and we'll try to have somebody okay. from but it's just easier for us to track people's thoughts when you can see red lines and cross outs than or underlines and cross outs as a, but and, and mr chairman do we know exactly what it is we're looking for as an output at the end of the day well i think that's what john was asking is are you happy with the 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 format of the parking lot items that each item is going to be a separate well, to piece me, of paper that we then discuss and then we come up with a and solution what I'm assuming, I, I, frankly, I, I, I would suggest we go with some of the easier ones first <laughs> but yeah <laughs> I, I agree less controversial I, I, ones I, I agree but I think his his question is more along the lines of what does it look like at the end not what specifics are included in it so are, are we happy with the way it's been presented so far the format of it Not particularly. Okay, what would you like to change? <laughs> what would you like to change? Well, whenever we discuss it, it just, it, there's too many discussions going on. At the, I mean, each one, I like that, I like it because then I can see where everybody's coming from, but I just, I don't see how we're gonna actually sit down. Are we gonna vote on each exact item or are we gonna discuss each one? And well, then are we reconstructing a statement that will look like John's original statement, but just cleaned up. Yeah, and I think Dave suggested putting it up okay. on a computer where okay. we can track the changes as okay, we're doing that makes it, sense which, to me. which okay. I like that concept. Um, mm -hmm. But I think for the interim, while we're trying to disseminate the information, d doing it as the red line with everybody's comments on the same page is a lot easier to follow. I mean, right. there are about 57, I think. Or something like that. I think that I counted about 57 of them now. It may turn out that. Half of those are so close to other ones that you'll just throw those out and incorporate the ideas in another one. Right. It may be that out of that half, half of those are beyond the scope of what you think you should be focusing on. So that, you know, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm assuming that this list is gonna get whittled down considerably and each one articulated as best you can. Right. Right. But the only way I knew to get there was to start with each one of them right. and, and do it on an individual I think page. So. I think too, what Dave, if, if we get hung up on one that it, it takes too much, just set that aside. And then the, one, the easy ones, put up, that way up, it was we'll make up easy a, ones you get. Make up okay, a parking lot for We'll feel like we lot. made accomplishments. Yeah, yeah. Easy <laughs> ones. This yeah, will yeah, be yeah, like a multi-story parking. It facility. will. It will be a parking yeah. deck. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so okay. those next two meetings in October, not the next meeting, but the two meetings on October 13th and 27th, we have no scheduled uh, presenters. Well, let, me, uh, let me ask you about that. We've uh, heard again from, from Serge mentioned today that uh, Bill, is it Milch? Is that Mitch, Mitch um, was another professor up at FGCU that could not make it today, but uh, we can certainly ask him to, to come. It sounds like he may have some interesting um, additional information to add. The stormwater guy? The stormwater? The ecology. Okay. But he... he um, Right. And design, I think he, design stormwater yeah. management systems is that what I okay. I think he will be at at the 29th meeting also oh good I told him he probably wouldn't be presenting at that because it's gonna be more of a workshop but he, he said he wanted to attend <clears throat> uh, so if you want we can try to set him up for one of the October meetings I also have a request that came in from Wayne Arnold Wayne Arnold represents the folks at shy wolf you heard from the public about um, their request that they have in for a special exception uh, he wanted an opportunity to come and speak to the group, and I told him I would 
bring that up and let the I, group decide. I would say that's a land use issue and not really within our purview. Me too. Anybody, yeah. anybody feel differently? I, mean, I appreciate his efforts, but I, I think he'd be wasting his time talking to us. Um, can you can you ask Audrey maybe to draft a quick memo as to how we deal with public comment at the work at the workshop? Mm. Okay. I mean, is um, it, it it is public comment sa same as here first couple minutes, last few minutes, or is it throughout frankly, the whole? Frankly, what I had envisioned. Uh, but I guess that's a good question for the group to, to let me know if I'm on the right page. Typically at uh, our uh, a city council workshop, um, they would allow for full public interaction. Which I'm happy with. I just, so, yeah. I, if that's okay, I'm okay with it. I just didn't know how it's supposed to I'll go. I'll confirm so. that with Audrey, but I, I, I assume that Everybody that else okay fine. with that? Or? We won't have to be passing the microphone. No, again, because we're not going to take recorded this minutes of checking, the interaction. That's that. That's that why a nightmare. It that's why I said at the, yeah. no. That's why I said at the beginning that minutes of a <laughs> workshop are usually very different than minutes of one of these meetings. Okay. We don't try to capture all that discussion. There'll be a video too, right there. Although, don't expect that the video is going to capture a lot of the audio. Again, it's not going to be very good television. Can we each wear a GoPro? You can. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that would be interesting. Um, not really. <laughs> oh, one final. Uh, no, and that is, well, actually two final notes. One is that we, we often get information about different grants, uh, oh. either from members of the public or from you folks. Yeah, and Kevin they, submitted one. Yeah. Kevin submitted one. I just wanted to, and I've reminded our city council of this also, is that we are always very eager to track down what money might be available to help us achieve our, uh, our goals. However, um, a lot has to happen for funding availability and timing of a grant submittal and our project to come together at the same time for those things to happen. So if you don't see us react to one of these, it doesn't mean that we're not interested. It doesn't mean we want to spend, spend tax dollars as opposed to grant dollars. It usually just means that the timing is such that the things aren't, aren't, don't fit. We have in the past, frankly, run into problems where we chase grant money by trying to fashion a project that really might not be ready yet and submit it and then have to go through alterations on the scope of work to actually be what we want it to be um, at the end. And those are not always easy to do with people who are giving out the money because they like to know beforehand what you're committing to. So we appreciate all that information that comes in, but don't be surprised if we don't react to all of them. We actually do pretty well at getting grant dollars, uh, but we can't go after all of them. Um, usually for logistical reasons. And then my final note is on the 29th, um, I may be running a little late for that, but because of the format, I'm not too concerned about it. Audrey will probably be there, so in terms of getting the meeting going and getting the conversation started, you should be okay. Uh, personal thing, I have a memorial service to go to that morning. Not sure when it's going to end, so there you go. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but thanks for letting us know. Thank you. All right. Is that all you have? That's it. Public comment. Before oh, sorry, Fred. I just wanted to say that everybody will get this email through John. It's simply an article entitled uh, Southwest Florida, quote, hot spot for wetlands. And you know, it's got a link to the site if you can get it. And it's a very interesting article. Thank you. Great. Please. Deborah McLean, publisher of the Banana Peel, and I did send that article out to 38,000 people and got good responses. So it is very newsworthy and, if, and it addressed the disappearing wetlands in southwest Florida. Um, I'm going to talk fast. Um, I find it fascinating the conversation about the urine meters. Uh, the Gardens of Bonita condominium abuts Leitner Creek and the Doggy Park abuts Leitner Creek. I once resided at the Gardens of uh, Benita Condo, and it's a wonderful place where you're not restricted to tiny dogs. You can have a real dog. And every morning, everyone's drinking coffee, and the dogs have friends, and the people are friendly, and all the grass for four feet on either side of any sidewalk is yellow burnt urine <laughs> every day, 365 days a year. And there was mention earlier about concentration of pets in gated communities contributing to Spring Creek's pollution. 
So I just wanted to bring that up, that that is a real factor, and we need to protect Leitner Creek from the new doggy park and from the gardens of Benita Condo because they haven't established years and years of puppy pee going into Leitner Creek. And then I'll keep going. Um, I don't want us to get steered away toward those tax dollars, which might be real if we did reach that potential build out that suggested a 5,000 units in the DRGR, because we have not raised the bar. It was mentioned earlier that the city must raise the bar, that we should incorporate surges ponds programs across the city, not just out there, that we should um, look into the infrastructure of Citrus Park and Gulf Coast RV Park and Imperial Harbor as they have never upgraded their sewer lines. So they are leaching fecal matter into the ground and into our water supplies. So what I would like to introduce to you the sector plan overview in Tallahassee on February 8th, 2012. And I have to quick do this because I'm handicapped here a little bit. There is, after the governor, I'm a Republican, and Governor Scott basically gutted all the protections for environment in the state of Florida, and he brought us a lot of jobs, and now he's trying to undo his boo-boos and put it all back in place. Now, although this is a little bit older, there is a segment in here that is really important. Whoops, went too far. Specific. Long-term master plan. It talks about water, transportation, and it talks about, where is it, where is it? Applicant can apply for a master development order to establish a build-out date until which approved use is not subject to downzoning or restrictions or reductions. I think that in our citywide master plan, and I remember when Bonita Bay started, if you didn't build on your lot, you bought a spec lot, and you didn't build on it, it is cheated back to the developer. I think it's time for us to seriously consider tying in our natural resource, which is water, to developers, and if they can't get it built, and then we find we have something happened north of us and our water supply is contaminated or less, that we can downzone this existing 110 that's on the books. Forget DRGR, we have an overpopulation problem. So there are things that we can do to raise the bar and the water table, but raising the bar means restrictions on development to save the water. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I hate to take up your time, but a few more comments. Kathy McGrath. I think that the presentations today were three of the best that I've heard of all the task force because I guess um, it, it kind of goes along. I think what I've said all along is that with proper development, we can develop in the DRGR high standards which the city can set. But let's face it, let me remind you, Logan Boulevard is going to come up from Collier County. And those roads are going to have to be widened. Uh, that's East, East Benita Beach Road, Benita Grand, and Terry Street down to Imperial Parkway. Whether anything is developed there or not, let's face it, there's going to be and has to be proper development. Benita Springs Utilities has the ability to put in the infrastructure for water and wastewater. The developers can implement things that were mentioned today. And uh, I am totally against us purchasing any more property. There's enough property in the public sector that can have water storage without us laying out anymore. So the presentations today said it can be done. There's always a compromise. You all don't have to set any limits or uh, density. But, and I know the, um, uh, the beginning thing is, you know, get the water right. It can be gotten right with proper development. It can be. And thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Yes, uh, Alex Grant. Uh, now, I was former. I was on the first local planning agency for four years. I think the mistake that I made was allowing the seventy-five thousand people in that local planning agency comprehensive land use plan that went to the state. We should have lowered it. If I would have known what I know now down by at least 15 percent to 60,000 people. Number one. Number two, I don't know how we went 
from 75,000 people to 110,000 people when I, uh, after I left the LPA to be on the city council for four years. Uh, so that's another problem. Uh, what I would, if I were still on the city council, what I would do, I would have a, instead of DRGR area, an extreme caution area, everything from Kent Road eastward. We've already got Citrus Park on the west side plus Morton Village and, and that area, but at least, at least be, have one unit per 10 acres from Kent Road eastward all the way to the city limits. And by the way, again, I would certainly recommend getting at, at least at the one of the last meetings here, somebody from the University of Florida Soils and Water Department talking about the hydric soils which are prevalent regardless of what was done with agriculture. These are very deep soils and disturbing two feet on top of these hydric soils isn't going to uh, cause any great difference in the problem with the hydric soils out there. So you need to have a hydric soils expert from the University of Florida talking to you. That's all I have to say. Thanks, Alex. John West. I'd like to touch on, Dennis, your presentation. It's been concern of me, of mine for some time, reading in the study that led up to this uh, committee about the 1% uh, tax that uh, the um, DRGR yields to the city. This is not a question of, it's a specious argument, in my opinion, that uh, money should come into this. Uh, it just happens to be that that area uh, could be valuable as uh, environmentally protected land. And it's up to you as a committee to see what, what can be done one way or other. Regarding wells, you know I've spent some time on wells. Uh, there are 38 uh, USGS wells uh, that are in the DRGR area. There's also 17 um, wells that are monitored by the uh, uh, Lee County Natural Resources. And uh, there are about six wells that uh, the USGS considers valuable. Uh, two of them are in Bonita Bay, three of them uh, with BSU and one of them is in West Bay area. Uh, regarding monitoring and volunteers, um, Cape Coral have uh, volunteers since 1995. Uh, they have uh, over 100 people who are uh, monitoring the canals there. There's a newsletter that goes round every month and um, uh, this is going gung-ho, and uh, we, we could think of, I think they call it a canal watch or something. We could have a, a well watch here or something like that in, in Bonita. And uh, there's also one in uh, um, Charlotte Harbor that has been going for some time. So I think it's a good idea to get people involved in this and uh, uh, get people interested in what's going on here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Anyone else for public comments? Seeing none, we're adjourned.